Right. Good morning and welcome to the public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission today for January 20th, 2023. We'll begin this morning by taking attendance and I will turn it over to the LPC General Counsel to call the roll. Mark? Chair Carroll? Here. Commissioner Bland? Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Here. Commissioner Chapin? Here. Commissioner Chen? Here. Commissioner Devonshire? Here. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Gustafson? Here. Commissioner Jefferson? Here. Commissioner Lutfi? Commissioner Lutfi? Commissioner Holford Smith? Here. All right. Good morning again and Happy New Year. Welcome to the first public hearing and public meeting of 2023 for the Landmarks Preservation Commission. This uh, meeting is being <coughs> held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. So if you would like to testify on any public hearing items, you may do so by joining the meeting at the estimated time, which is shown on the agenda for the hearing, which can be found on our website. And if you would like to just watch the proceedings, you may do so at our YouTube channel. And uh, this morning we have a public hearing for a number of new applications for work on designated properties. And then we will also have a public meeting um, a agenda for items that have already had a public hearing and are back today with revisions. And with that, I will turn it over to our Director of Preservation, Corey Harala, to take us through both agendas. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, and before we begin, I do want to note a schedule change. Um, this afternoon, we will be moving public meeting item number two, which concerns 112 Second Avenue, the Middle Collegiate Church application. We will be moving that to be the first item that we review after lunch. Uh, so that will occur before a couple of the public hearing items, before we finish the, the hearing item agenda, most likely hearing items seven and eight. Uh, subject to further changes. So uh, we will be reviewing that after lunch, uh, public meeting item number two at approximately 1.15. Uh, we'll resume the, the hearing schedule and then the meeting schedule from there. Uh, so with that, we'll uh, now start the public hearing agenda, starting with public hearing item number one, LPC 23-01133, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, block 945, lot 74. 101 St. John's Place in the Park Slope Historic District. This is a neo greek style row house built in 1881 to 82, and the application is to construct a rear yard addition. And commissioners, um, staff will be presenting. Um, staff, you now have control of the presentation. You may begin. So Janelle, I'm not sure if you're speaking, but we, if you can just I'm unmute. Not, yeah, I'm trying to get back to the beginning of the presentation. All right, let me see if I can just try closing something else. Hang on. so much. Okay, you can try again. Sure. Good morning, commissioners. Um, Janelle Gunther, preservation staff. The item before you is for 101 St. John's Place in the Park Slope Historic District, located on the north side of the street near the corner of 6th Avenue. I will take you through the details of the proposal to construct a rear yard addition, which will not be visible from public thoroughfares. 
Janelle, if you could adjust your mic, it's not coming in uh, as clearly as it could. Is that better? Yes. That's much better. Okay. And just if you could re restate your name just so we can start over now that we can hear you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Good morning, commissioners. Janelle Gunther, preservation staff. Um, do I need to repeat the first slide? That would be great. Okay. The item before you is for 101 St. John's Place in the Park Slope Historic District, located on the north side of the street near the corner of 6th Avenue. I will take you through the details of the proposal to construct a rear yard addition, which will not be visible from public thoroughfares. Next slide, please. You should have control, Janelle. I'm not sure that I do. Okay, let's try that. Um, current photos, which do not appear to be visible at the moment, <clears throat> show an existing one-story addition at the rear facade to be removed. Um, I'm not sure why they are not showing. Why don't I um, take control for you and I'll advance the slides. Thank you. Um, just so in case we're experiencing any difficulties with the transmission. All right, just give me one moment. Great. Um, so you can see in the center photograph, the existing one story addition to be removed and the rear facade conditions um, at the adjacent properties. Next slide, please. These axonometric diagrams describe the massing of the existing partial width addition extension to be removed and the proposed full width addition to be constructed. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> there, the rear yard extensions have, oh, sorry, can you go back one, please, to slide six? It's not loading for some reason. Okay, um, all right. that's all right. So slide six was a Sanborn map showing the rear yard extensions that have historically been present at the block. Um, however, as this block plan shows, um, alterations and removals have occurred over time. And so this block does not currently meet the simple majority threshold for review at staff level. <clears throat> One story additions remain prevalent at the block as indicated in yellow on this block plan. Next slide, please. Um, the next two slides show some examples of these additions, um, some of which feature roof decks on them. Next slide, please. And the next slide. Here's a drawing of the rear elevation showing the proposed addition. Next slide, please. And a rendered version of the same, <clears throat> as well as, next slide, please. I'm just going to try closing this and reopening it. Okay. One moment. All right. So here's the rendering of the rear. And then next slide. The applicant has provided the materials palette for the addition. Next slide, please. Um, these are some technical drawings showing the proposed demolition and construction at the rear facade. Uh, next slide. 
the demolition floor plans for the first and uh, the basement and first floors. And next slide. And these are the proposed plans for the basement and first floors. And um, that is the extent of the presentation. And the applicant is present to discuss the appropriateness of the okay. addition and to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is commissioners a, a, a proposal for a one story rear yard addition in a block that has um, other one story additions and rear decks and it's not visible from a public way. So are there any questions for Janelle or for the owner? Okay, I don't see any questions. Why don't we see if we have public testimony for this item? And if you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through any testimony. Thank you, Chair Caro. We received one sign up in advance for this application and that being uh, Lucy Levine from Historic Districts Council. So Lucy Levine, I'm going to promote you to panelists now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine, speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds the massing of this proposed addition appropriate, but we agree with our colleagues at Clark Slope Civic Council that the penetration on the ground and parlor floors is inappropriate. Specifically, we feel the windows lack compositional consistency and read four different styles. The second floor window should, retain, should remain the same as the floor above. The lintel should bear on four inches of masonry on either side of the masonry opening, and the sill- can't really hear. Um, I'm sorry, should I begin again? Oh, um, or just maybe the start at the last sentence, just pick up at the, restate the last sentence. Sure. The second floor windows should remain the same as the floor above. The lintels should bear on four inches of masonry on either side of the masonry opening, and the sills should extend no more than two inches past the masonry opening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Lucy. Levine. Uh, I'm looking through our uh, participant list, and there don't appear to be any further hands raised. So I will note for the record that Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommends conditional approval black and vertical. And that is all, thank you. I'm sorry, Gregory, I didn't hear, there was a, your um, mic was breaking up a little bit or maybe it was my internet, but could you just repeat the final sentence you said about the community board resolution? Yes, Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommends conditional approval asking for the railings to be made of wrought iron, painted black and vertical. Okay. Did that come out? Yes, it did, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, all right, so I know we have some questions, but let me see if the owner would like to respond to the testimony we've heard. I think there was uh, comments about wanting vertical pickets on the railing, which maybe was changed since the community board and then uh, comments on the dimensions of the openings. Is the owner here? So, um, good morning. I'm the architect and I'm representing the owner. My name is Mary. Great, um, so you. just in a response first to the community board, we did update our presentation to reflect the vertical railings. Um, we had originally proposed horizontal and so we updated it. So what you see is the updated drawings. Uh, in reference to the uh, enlargement of the windows on the second floor, I believe this was something that uh, we worked through at the staff level of the LPC uh, and we were allowed to enlarge it. The only reason for enlargement was to um, bring in additional light into the bedrooms on the second floor. Um, and uh, again, if there is a major objection to it, we are open to reconsidering. Okay, thank you. And I and I will just note that the windows at the second floor actually do meet the rules this to, and are eligible for a staff level permit. So what's really before the commission is the extension at the first floor. All right, do, questions? Vice Chair Bland, I thought you had a question. Maybe it's been answered. All right, any final questions, commissioners? 
Okay. Let me go ahead and start to send you a request to unmute so we can begin our discussion. Okay, so uh, again, the, the piece that is before the commission is the one-story rear yard extension. The window modifications at the second floor are eligible for a staff level review. And again, this is a non-visible brick addition uh, with a deck and picket railing on top um, that is in a, a block uh, with a, that has uh, predominantly one-story uh, one story rear yard additions and decks. And um, we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Chen, would you like to start this one? You have to move to close the hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, John. <laughs> All right, C C Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? <laughs> so moved. <laughs> and Commissioner Holford Smith, would you second that motion? I second it. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed. Thank you, John, for reminding me of that. It's been too long of a break. Okay, Commissioner Chen, would you go ahead and start this discussion? Yeah, I think this is pretty straightforward. Uh, given the context, um, I, I, have, I, I have no problem with this. Okay, thank you. And uh, Vice Chair Bland? Uh, uh, agreed, uh, very straightforward. We've um, approved these sorts of additions many, 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 many times before. My question was going to be about those windows on the second floor, uh, but if it's staff level approval, and of course it's not visible from a public thoroughfare, I don't have any issue with it, nor would I be able to if it's approvable by the rules. So I think this is fine. We're off to a easy start in 2023. Yes, <laughs> just this one. All right, and Commissioner Latvey, I know you joined us. I don't know if you were here for enough of the presentation to comment on this, and that's fine if you weren't. Um, I I wasn't here for the presentation, but I am versed in it, so it's up to you if okay. it makes sense for me. Sure, I? if you've reviewed the packet, it, again, it's a one-story addition within a block uh, of other one-story additions in rear yard decks. Yeah. Um, so in reviewing the packet, I uh, want to say that I, I actually think it's very appropriate. It's, uh, you know, simple. The uh, it doesn't um, protrude extensively into the rear yard. And um, uh, I think they did a very good job, actually. OK, great. Commissioner Jefferson. It's very appropriate. Commissioner Gustafson. Appropriate. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Appropriate, yes. Okay. Commissioner Holford Smith. Appropriate. And Commissioner Chapin. It's modest and appropriate. Okay. And Commissioner Devinger. It's modest and appropriate. Um, I would not have uh, voted for the second story window change, but that's a fait accompli. Okay. All right, so I think we have a consensus on the rear yard addition. Commissioner Chen, would you make the motion? I'd be delighted to. Uh, in the matter of LPC 23-01133, uh, no St. John's Place, a Park Slope Historic District, the application is to construct a rear yard addition, noting the building's uh, style, scale, materials, and details among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Park Slope Historic District. I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features that the proposed rear yard addition will not be visible from any public thoroughfares. that <coughs> uh, other rear yard additions with a similar height and depth exist within the block and that the proposed one-story rear yard addition will be modest in scale and will not overwhelm the building, adjacent buildings, or the block's central green space. That the plain brick uh, cladding and multi-light door assembly will harmonize with the materials and fenestration pattern of the rear facade of the building, that the work will not diminish the special uh, architectural and historic character of the Park Slope Historic District. Thank you. And Commissioner Luffy, would you second this motion? Second. Thank you. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devinger. Aye. 
Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. All right, that's approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. And the next item is public hearing item number two, LPC 23-03624, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 621, lots 75 and 76, 79 and 81 Charles Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District. These are two French Second Empire style row houses designed by William H. Hume and built in 1866. The application is to combine the buildings, construct rooftop and rear yard additions, and excavate the cellar and rear yard. And commissioners, the, the applicants have entered the hearing. Uh, you now have control of the screen. Just click on the screen to advance, uh, and you may begin. Good morning, commissioners. Happy New Year. Erin Ruley, Higgins, Quays, Barth, and Partners. We are the preservation consultants for the project. Uh, Mariana, do you have control? Can someone enable me, please? Uh, you have yeah. remote control. You just have to click on the screen. And then use your arrow keys to advance. So, Mariana, you should have a prompt. It says it's waiting for you to control. Uh, it says you cannot start screen share while the other participants. Oh, no, no. I'm I'm sharing the screen and you are remote control. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Your remote control accessing it. So if you can see the presentation, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah, so just click on the screen. Right. Mm -hmm. And then um, you can use either your arrow keys or the mouse to advance. Yeah, yeah. O opening the year with technological issues. Um, uh, commissioners, uh, today um, we're looking at 79 and 81 Charles Street and I'm joined by the project team. Uh, we have Stephen Harris of Stephen Harris Architects, of course, um, Abir Ahmad of Stephen Harris and Mariana Riobam of Stephen Harris. Uh, we're also joined by the project engineers in case there are any questions related to uh, the structural interventions or the excavation. And that's Tori Strzok of Silman and Doug Roy of GCMA. And so here we're looking at 79 and 81. 79 is on the right and 81 is on the left. Uh, tree is going through 79. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, these are two in a row of seven buildings on the north side of, of Charles Street, uh, located between Bleecker and, and West 4th Street. And of course, that's, that's all in the Greenwich Village Historic District. Um, and so the, the proposal is to merge these two buildings and we'll be looking at the, the specific interventions as, as we go through. Next slide. Uh, so here is a, a good overview of the, the uh, totality of the project. Um, we see on the left, the proposed uh, front facade and on the back, on the right is the is the rear elevation proposed rear elevation um, and the modifications include um, some alteration to the areaway and areaway railings um, on the front facade, and then uh, rooftop additions um, uh, uh, that straddle both buildings. Uh, these are not visible with the exception of the uh, required chimney dimensions that we see um, in the top right. Thank you. And um, at the rear, there are uh, rear yard extensions. Uh, there's also excavation and uh, interior modifications to, the, to combine the buildings. Uh, in addition to the, the hearing level scope, there's a full complement of facade restoration um, uh, for the project. Um, and I think that you can see here from from these just two glimpses of the of the project, that the the fundamental approach um, is to um, uh, a very intentional effort to maintain the distinct reading of the buildings. So while we're merging the buildings, um, having acknowledging them as two separate buildings historically. So you'll see this throughout the design in the design of the addition and how the modifications are detailed. Uh, the rooftop additions are distinct between the, the two buildings and the rear elevation maintains the separate reading of the, of the two buildings in a row. Um, the, the north 
facing windows, which is the rear elevation, um, have been uh, modeled and inspired by studio window, studio windows and skylights that we see throughout the district. Um, and of course, um, that's a, a contemporary um, interpretation um, that really relates not just to the, um, the buildings themselves, but to the overall context to give the project meaning and, and substance within, within its context. Um, and I think from here, Mariana, we can go to the next slide. So I'm going to walk you through some of the existing conditions and context, uh, history, uh, and how we've been thinking about the project. And then Stephen and Abir will uh, walk you through the specifics of the design. Um, 79 and 81, it, 81 is the westernmost building in, in the pair. Uh, had, in 2017, there was a proposal approved for the for that building uh, that's very uh, comparable to, to what we're seeing today. Rooftop addition, two-story rear yard extension and excavation. As you can see on the right uh, rear elevation, it was um, there's a high degree of glazing on the rear yard extension. Um, and uh, so that that's approved. Um, it, the permit was extended and recently expired. Um, but again, a very, very comparable um, uh, set of approvals for, for one of the buildings in the pair. Next slide. Um, as Corey mentioned, the building um, is uh, the buildings are two in a row of seven that were originally constructed in 1866 in the French Second Empire style. Um, in the mid 1920s, mid to late 1920s, uh, both of the buildings went through uh, similar changes. Uh, so. As we see throughout the district, the um, uh, there's a certain set of, of modifications that that happened when the buildings were converted for for multifamily use. So the strip the stoops were stripped. Uh, the entry was converted, the basement entry was converted as the primary entry of the building and uh, entry surrounds were removed. Parlor floor window, parlor floor entry was converted for a window. Um, and in this case, these tall, tall fences were installed at the at the area way. Um, the facades were painted uh, at that time, and it's likely that uh, that was to mask the, the ghosting or the removal of the entry surround at the parlor floor. Um, also of note is the, the parlor floor windows were, were shortened. Um, there's an added string course below the windows and the, the um, uh, lintels were simplified. And so while they were dis distinct buildings, they had a very comparable set of alterations um, that created a, a similarity in their existing condition. Next slide. And we see that existing condition here. Um, on the right is the view of the buildings head on, but on the left is um, the view looking east, showing you the row. So this is in the context of the block. 79 and 81 are those first two brick buildings at your left. Um, so right after the, the brownstone facade. And um, you can see here that because of the removal of the stoop, and the removal of the entryway there's um and the the weaving together of the brick that happens in the entirety of the row there's a certain continuity that we see across these two buildings in the existing condition next slide and then just a view of the base of the building you'll note at the um, parlor floor you can see the ghosting so the buildings were painted at when they were altered uh, to cover up the the sort of scarring of the the modifications at the parlor floor. Um, and since then, they've been um, restored to the brick facade. And so you see some of that um, the the ghost, and that'll all be uh, addressed as part of the the alter uh, restoration package of the project. And then at the at the area way, take a look look at the, at the railings. 79 is uh, in very good condition. That's the building on the right. Um, intact, highly ornamental, both ornamental uh, newel cages, posts, and um, and the, the pickets. And then at 81, we have historic um, newel cages, but then it appears to be a, a later utilitarian railing that's been attached at the, at the railing. Next slide. And then just a few details, uh, 79 Charles is on the, the top, 81 Charles is on the bottom, and these are just views of the existing areaways and the railing. So again, that, that highly ornamental uh, railing at 79, um, fence at 79. Uh, proposal here is to add a gate 
at number 79, there's currently one at 81. Um, and then at the, on the photo up on the right, looking east in the area way, you can see the area way level is at the, the, the entryway. There's a difference in the, the levels between the two area ways and the proposal is to create a unified level at the entryway. Um, 81s is at the, the sidewalk level currently. Also, um, the basement level grills um, are not consistent. The ironwork is different than um, what exists on both the entry and the, the fence. So uh, proposal is to restore that back to the original ironwork within that bay, uh, which would be consistent with 81. 81 retains its original uh, grill work, as does most of the row. On the bottom number, you see the, again, more details of the fence uh, at 81, and that's all proposed to be replaced with a very simple picket um, with the intent of maintaining the differentiation between, between the two buildings. Next slide. Uh, just jumping around to the back of the building, the existing conditions. Um, here, when we're looking at the rear, 79 is on the left, 81 is on the right. And um, you can see 79 has a uh, two, one and two story rear yard extension and number 81 has a, a one story. Again, number 81 is the one where the there is an exist, there was an existing approval for a two-story rear yard extension. Um, and then a couple of views of the, the rear yards with a combination of paving and, and, and green space. Um, also of note, the, the rear facades have been coated, and this is a thorough seal-like product um, that we, we're seeing over both of the buildings. Next slide. And then just a bit about the, the existing rear yard contact as we're um, looking back from the building, um, the, there is a um, uh, distinct reading between the Western edge side of the block and the Eastern side of the block. So the Western side is really dictated by the presence of the uh, four and five story buildings along Bleecker Street. And that is uh, very much the sort of the context within um, our building resides. And then to the east is the sort of more typical uh, 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 Greenwich Village donut condition, verdant mature plantings, consistent plane of, of row house facades all to the east. And so on the top left, we're looking toward the Bleecker Street uh, buildings. Those are four and five stories. They have commercial ground floors and very short rear yards, which you can see, um, shallow rear yards that we can see in the um, in the block plan below. And then uh, the center photo looking directly north. So this is um, the buildings that front onto Perry Street and, and some of the Bleecker Street buildings. And you can see the intersection of um, the Bleecker Street lots and the Perry Street lots and how that sort of confluence works. Um, and then um, to the right in that photo is a five-story apartment building that fronts onto Perry Street. Um, it's a, a very handsome apartment building, but in the context of the mid block really creates a hard boundary between this Western section of the, of the block and then what happens to the, to the East beyond. Um, and I, we see that it all in the aerial view of the block. Next slide. And then, of course, in in um, addition to the approval for number eighty one, there have been a number of rear yard extensions added um, uh, to the buildings within the block. And here we see sort of the standard treatment: so a two story rear yard extension with the upper plane of the the buildings preserved, um, and uh, directly across the 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 block from us, we see number eighty four, the top right. Yeah, it's great, uh, which is fully glazed. Um, so that sort of varies a bit from what um, happens elsewhere in the block, but is really consistent with the um, the ad hoc nature of what's happening in this western edge of the block. In addition, there's the um, full lot extension at number eighty six Perry, which is a um, which oh I, I think right, which um, has a sort of commercial uh, full lot extension and, and character to it, a uh, tall one-story addition. Next slide. Similarly, we see this um, in terms of rooftop additions surrounding the site. Um, and, and 
uh, specifically in the buildings that between Bleecker, um, the Bleecker Corner and um, our neighbors on, on Charles Street. And so at 80, Five Charles, there's a rooftop addition. Number 83 Charles has a, a, a glazed rooftop addition that is up against our, the party wall of our um, uh, number 81. And then, of course, 77 has a partial width uh, rooftop addition. Um, and then there are, in addition, there are a combination of other full and partial width additions in the long. Next slide. And then finally, just um, before I pass the presentation to Stephen and Abir, I think um, just a little bit about how we've been thinking about the project and uh, efforts to differentiate the, the additions and how these buildings read. Um, so uh, we have looked to the studio window model, of course, um, and historically there's this great diversity of in the design of studio windows. We often think about it just as that simple canted skylight form, but there really is um, a tremendous amount of variety in how they were applied, all with the sort of common goal of bringing light into that top floor. Um, and so here we just see a handful of those uh, on Bedford Street in this stretch of three or four buildings, how they, the interventions were integrated into the facades at um, Stuyvesant Street, where uh, Skylight is bridging to historic dormers, and Grove Street, where you get that glazed roof plane intersecting with the glazing on the front facade. Um, and then specifically, um, these two examples on the right, where it, they, these are sort of overscaled um, uh, uh, windows that have a three-part configuration that relate to what's happening below. Um, and I think that um, as we were thinking through how to um, differentiate between these two buildings, this, this idea of a modern interpretation of the various types of, of studio windows really has um, come to fruition. And uh, this is, I think, in a way, uh, not just the distinction between the two buildings, but also makes it relevant to the place itself. And so I think with that, I'll pass the presentation to uh, Stephen and Abir. Um, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Abir Ahmed, presenting on behalf of Stephen um, Harris Architects. Uh, on the screen, we have uh, the existing front facade, 79 on the right, 81 on the left. Um, Aaron has already shared uh, a number of photographs of the existing uh, conditions. Uh, next. Um, our proposal is to uh, restore the front facade. We're going to resurface uh, the brownstone at the sills and the lintels, uh, resurface the brownstone stucco at the area way, uh, restore the cornice, replace the windows with sort of historically accurate two over two uh, wood windows. Um, We've also made a concerted effort, as Erin had stressed, um, to sort of maintain the individuality of these two buildings in, in rather subtle ways, uh, starting with the brownstone details. Um, if you look at number 81, uh, we've taken our cues from the tax photo and have sort of created these brownstone recess panels above the front door and the two adjacent windows. This is sort of unique to 81. Uh, we've similarly uh, taken that approach towards the areaway fence. At number 79, we're proposing sort of a strict sort of restoration of the beautiful ornate ironwork. Um, we're adding a gate to match the character of the ironwork. Whereas at number 81, um, we're uh, replacing the fence with a very simple sort of picket fence with pointed sort of finials, spaced four inches on center, really discreet, and replacing the gate in kind. Uh, we've also taken that approach towards the two entryways, sort of setting up a hierarchy with number 79 having a restored uh, front door uh, that is glazed. And at number 81, we're proposing a new uh, painted mahogany, very, very discreet door. Uh, this approach then extends up towards the two rooftop additions. At number 79, we're proposing um, you know, aluminum sliding windows, um, metal cladding versus at, 90, at number 81, we're proposing a very discreet stucco facade. Nothing that you see up at the top will be visible from public right of way with the exception of two fireplace flues that are visible from a tiny sliver of space at the corner of, at the Southwestern corner of uh, Bleecker and Charles. Next, um, this is the existing um, areaway. 
Um, again, Erin had shared a number of photographs um, that describe this in further detail. Next. Um, our proposal is to uh, unify the area away by bringing it all up to a single plane. Um, we are going to be uh, surfacing it in bluestone, redoing the uh, brownstone stucco with the area ways. Um, here you can sort of see the two entryways in greater detail and our intention, you know, with uh, regards to creating this hierarchy with uh, a restored front door at number 79. Um, and a more discreet uh, painted mahogany door at number 81. Um, here you can also see that we're preserving the historic plaque at number 79, um, you know, marking um, the importance of that entry with sort of plantings and also replacing the grill work um, at um, the windows of the area way um, to match what is currently at number 81. And it's also more consistent with the historic precedent that you see existing in the row. Um, and then we have basically further description on the top of uh, the intercoms, uh, recessed trash cans. Everything will be very, very discreet that we're proposing. Uh, next. So just before we get into the rare, I uh, just wanted to sort of um, just reintroduce what this end of the block feels like. It is somewhat, I'd use the word discontinuous from the more picturesque donut that you experience to the east. Um, you know, we have the uh, taller five-story buildings that front Bleecker Street. Um, we have the two-story, um, uh, we have the five-story apartment building that sort of extends further into the lot uh, across from us. And um, next. So um, here is the existing um, rare facade for 7981. 81 is on the right, 79 is on the left. Um, just wanted to uh, stress that we are sort of flanked um, by two rooftop additions um, that are very sort of distinct in character. Next. So our proposal is to um, add a two-story addition um, at the rare facade that's very consistent with the scale of other two-story additions um, within the donut. Um, we're gonna be cladding it in red face brick uh, with brown, uh, blue stone sills and lintels, dark painted steel windows. Um, you know, here you start to see our attempt at uh, maintaining sort of this individual reading, the two houses. Uh, we do that in a number of ways. First, with the widened brick pier between the two sets of windows. Um, that sort of marks the separation between the two houses. The decorative overflow scupper that again sort of reinforces this sort of center line between the two houses. Um, and then, of course, the split brick cornice that you see. Uh, this is a direct replica of the split brick cornice that's found typically sort of, you know, uh, on these rows of houses at the top. And what you see exactly at that upper floor, you know, historically, it's really the only thing that would have um, created sort of a separate reading between this continuous surface. And so we are reintroducing that approach. Um, at the upper floors, um, we, we've we used sort of this reading of a leader um, to uh, re reinforce the separation between the two houses, which is again, what you see sort of typically as you look down the row. Uh, we are proposing to rebuild the entire um, top two floors. Uh, they are going to be built in exactly the same configuration as what is currently there in the same plane with the cornices aligning um, sort of that continuity um, it, that is currently um, present in these in the row of houses. Moving up to the rooftop additions, um, we had some uh, fun here interpreting um, the historic precedents that Erin had shared with you. Um, on the left at number 79, we're proposing a taller artist skylight um, that's gonna be sort of clad in a metal fascia versus on the right, this is sort of our interpretation of sort of these modernized dormers that align with the windows below, um, as Aaron had pointed out in those historic precedents. Uh, the facade here will be a very sort of discreet stucco facade. Um, next. 
Um, just again, um, an image showing a section cut through the uh, second floor terrace, which shows again how we're sort of creating distinction by dropping the sills um, at these sort of wood windows, uh, wood doors rather, um, at number 81. Uh, whereas at number 79, we're sort of maintaining the sort of raised sills with double hung windows. Uh, the windows uh, for the top two floors will be uh, painted wood windows, uh, two over two for the most part, which is sort of consistent um, with um, precedent. Next. Um, just a quick sort of section through this end of the block. Um, just wanted to stress uh, the variety of rooftop additions and the fact that you really do read this end of the block against that sort of very dominant tall wall of buildings at Bleecker Street. Um, next. Uh, a three-dimensional rendering of what it really feels like to be in sort of these backyards looking back at the house or with the tall wall of buildings at Bleecker, um, the variety of rooftop additions. Um, and so you sort of really get a sense how our proposed red brick um, addition um, will sort of blend in with the reading of um, the houses currently at the rear yard. Also wanted to use this as an opportunity sort of to stress that um, the windows that overlook the garden um, are actually very discreet in context in the context of what you see. Their heads are pretty much in line with our fence. Um, and so um, really barely perceivable from the backyard. Next. Um, here we have a section through number 79. Um, this shows the extent of our proposed excavation, which will be pulled back five feet from the property line as is required, which will allow for tall plantings of the rear. In addition, we're also providing three feet of soil um, above sort of the excavation to allow for larger specimen trees, which are really more in character with what you see in the donut further to the east. So we're bringing a little bit of that um, in, 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 into our into the into the project um, with the artist skylight up top, you can sort of see um, nothing up here will be visible uh, from public right of way. We are holding the artist skylight back four feet um, from the rear cornice line, um, and uh, the only visibility, as we stressed earlier, is uh, those two fireplace flues um, that. Um, will be visible from a tiny sliver of space at the corner of Bleecker and Charles. Um, next. So here we have a section through number 81. Uh, the magenta line uh, represents what was previously approved um, in 2017. Um, and so as you can see, what we're proposing is very consistent um, with what um, was previously approved. Um, next. A uh, plan of the um, garden level, the basement floor, um, showing again our strategy for the garden, um, plantings um, at the rare and large uh, specimen trees. Um, also wanted to use this opportunity um, to point out that at the um, entry floor at the garden level, even though we've reconfigured the plan, we are uh, maintaining this reading of separation between the two houses. Um, and this approach is then taken at the uh, basement, the second floor, and the third floor. Next, um, parlor floor. Um, next, uh, second floor. And here, just again, um, this shows uh, our rebuilding of the rare facade, which will be exactly in the plane rebuilt, uh, in the same plane as the existing, um, with the window configurations and sort of the height of the lintels, um, you know, uh, will basically recreate what was there before, except we will be dropping the sills at number 81 um, and uh, maintaining sort of the raised sills and double hung windows at number 79. Next. Um, third floor, um, again, our proposal is to rebuild the rare to match the existing. Next. Um, so here you see our approach um, at the um, fourth floor, the rooftop additions. And here you can sort of see the artist skylight at number 79 at the bottom and um, our uh, modern interpretation of these pop-out bay windows or rather pop-out dormers, modernized dormers at, the, um, at number uh, 81. And here again, you can see that we are holding back um, the um, rare, uh, a minimum of three feet 
um, from the rear facade. Um, it, it's actually closer to five feet if, and four, four feet if you um, look at it in context, uh, in, in, uh, if you look at it sort of in context to sort of the skewed um, existing rear facade. Next. Um, rooftop equipment, none of this is visible from public right of way, the bulkhead, the elevator bulkhead, with the exception of two flues. Um, right, um, next. Um, so here we are at the corner of uh, Bleecker and Charles, and there's this tiny sliver of space, you know, if you sort of walk towards the southern, south western edge of Bleecker and Charles, where you catch um, the flues that we've sort of mocked up, um, you know, when perceived against the existing context and the roofscape of what's adjacent to us, it's barely noticeable. I should also add that there is currently one flu that is more visible um, than what we are proposing um, that we will be demolishing. Next. So in conclusion, um, we'll leave you with um, um, a rendering of the front and the rear. Thank you very much. All right, we have, I think, some questions. Vice Chair Bland, please go ahead. There, unmuted. My question is, uh, why are you rebuilding the top two floors and the rear? Is that, is that because they're in poor shape? Or? I think I can answer that, uh, the Commissioner Bland, Stephen Harris. Mm -hmm. um, the back facades of both are currently painted with a paint, which in our experience, when you remove the paint, you remove the surface of the brick as well. And while I think that theoretically, if the brick were determined to be intact and in good shape, we wouldn't rebuild it. It's only because in our experience, when you remove that from the back, it, uh, it, it peels the face off the brick as well, no matter how carefully. Got it, thank you. Thank you, and Commissioner Holford-Smith. Um, well, to follow up on Fred's question, um, if you just repainted the back, you would, would not need to rebuild the back facades. I understand that the preference is to have uh, natural brick, but if if they were to be painted, you could maintain the existing material. Um, potentially, but the if I'm not mistaken, the houses to either side are are brick. So the rest of the terrace is brick. So if one were attempting to uh, reinforce the reading of the donut and uh, recapitulate those seven houses that were part of the original terrace. Um, it was our goal to engage those. Um, the back facade is not in very good shape uh, in general. Uh, if you look at the photograph of the rear facade, the existing rear facade, I think you'll see that it's pretty rough. Um, somewhere in there, we've got a photograph of the back of the house. I mean, you can see it, I mean, uh, there, you know, um, everything is, I mean, I think by the time we replace the lentils, if you look at, if you look at number 79, particularly the westernmost top floor window, you'll see that the head of that window is, uh, is listing to starboard. Uh, and I think that the, you know, all the way through, this is, pretty scruffy and I'm not convinced that it can be straightened up without having to rebuild it. A lot of the repairs done to this building over time, starting in the 20s when they removed the stoops, was done in a rather slapdash way. Um, we are, if you look at the existing, for example, facade on the street, you'll see that the, it's quite legible where the original door was and, you know, the brick has been uh, put back in in a rather clumsy way. We've had, we've had very good luck with uh, uh, redoing that in many cases. But to answer your question, in theory, 
you wouldn't have to rebuild it if you painted it. Right. I have another question about yes. visibility on slide 32. Um, it looks like the, the railing is visible as well as the flues. Um. I think that might be the railing of the adjacent building, but let's take a look. Oh, that is yeah. definitely not, not our railing. That's not ours, yeah. Okay. That's on number 83, the Correct. existing okay. railing. Got it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Devonshire, followed by Commissioner Lutfi. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Uh, further to that discussion about the rear wall, if if it's, um, Coated with Thuraseal. Thuraseal is um, is almost a dangerous material to be on brick masonry. It's it's extremely tenacious. Uh, Stephen is correct. You can't. There's no way to even gently blast it off without taking the fire skin off the brick. It's impossible. Um, what we had success with at the Merchants House Museum. Um, the, the other problem is it entraps moisture that's trying to, to uh, transmit through the wall. And so moisture gets trapped in the wall. And I would imagine there are some, some serious problems with the mortar um, within that rear wall. So I, I actually, I'm in support of it. What we were successful in doing at the Merchant's House Museum was removing the brick and turning it around so that the back face was now exposed to um, the exterior and resetting it in a in a more lime rich mortar um, which is probably what's going on on this building anyway the the rear mortar is is lime rich and so um in in support of his discussion i would say it's it's actually a very wise thing to get to get rid of the third seal and rebuild that section of wall. Thank you, Commissioner. I think that you're quite likely right. We did a, we renovated a house on Waverly Place probably 15 years ago, where once we began to in investigate the brick, we actually had to, you could actually unstack the bricks. Yeah. That, and the and mortar the was so deteriorated that you could yeah. by hand unstack right. them. The we third seal is the only thing holding the the wall together in that yep. case. Yep. But I like your idea of turning the bricks around. At, at Merchant's House, God knows we have just, a surface of brick because yeah, we, of we could the tap them at the down. Merchant's House and yeah. pull them out by hand. The, right. the mortar would just pour out because it had gone into solution, the, the lime, and effloresced on the interior of the building. It was a nightmare. Thorough seal is absolutely the kiss of death. But I, I think the idea of I, we're... If it's at all possible, I think taking apart the facade and turning the bricks around is a great idea. Because give, it a, give it a try. We'll try it, you know, uh, because I think that for all the bricks we will lose, we have extras from the lower part of the wall that we're taking out. So we, right. we might potentially have enough brick to use the existing brick because, I mean, try yep. as you will, you can't perfectly match the adjacent houses. Sure, sure. Yeah, anyway, I thanks. Think, Thank you. Reusing brick if, if at all possible, I think it's the preferred yeah. solution. Okay, Commissioner Lutfi. Thank you. Just a couple of clarifications. So on, um, I think it's slide, is it slide 35 where you show the donut and you show, um, the rear yard, the incursion into the into the rear yard of the addition. I just wanted to the, get a the block I just, plan. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted a confirmation of whether or not this is existing or this is what it's going to be. Oh, um, Abir, what's yeah, the delta between what's the what's the difference between the existing 
ex ex depth of the existing extension and uh, on both buildings and the proposed new extension. I think it's the same plane. Um, well, there's a one story addition on one of them. Uh, Almost. So we're 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 maintaining the 30 foot rear yard setback that's required. Right. But for us, the question is, is we, we do look at whether or not it diminishes the green space, but we also look at how it relates to the other additions. So understanding whether it's forward of the plane of the others or so back we of are it. so you can you can see here we're slightly forward of the plane of the additions on either side. If you look at the uh, at the adjacent buildings, you can see them on that drawing, the walls of the adjacent uh, additions. They're within a foot of. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Okay, and then my next question, it's uh, similar. So in terms of the rooftop additions, um, well, number one, what are the the heights of both of them? And then also relative to, uh, let's say, the the volumes of uh, the rooftop additions that are on other homes within this donut, what 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 does yours look like proportionally? So we are slightly taller than our um, than than the rooftop addition to our east. Uh, we're proposing, uh, you can sort of see there, it's about 12 feet from um, the floor surface, but also keep in mind that, you know, we are dropping um, sort of uh, the, the roof plane, meaning we are depressing this addition relative to the front corners. Um, so so in, in that regard, we are trying to keep it low. We're not maxed out by any case um, with, uh, with the height that we could build this addition to um, at number 79. Um, There's an anomaly in the zoning code where the, uh, where number 81 is within a hundred feet of Bleecker Street and therefore has a different FAR than the rest of the, uh, the number 79. If you look at this drawing carefully, you can see a dotted line of where the existing roof is. It drops right behind the front cornice and, and runs at an angle across there. Mm -hmm. That's the existing mm -hmm. roof. Right, so we are- Mariana, maybe go a, to the front elevation. I'm sorry, Chair. That's okay. I mean, I just, you know, we often have approved depressing the top floor so that the addition can be sunk in and uh, that helps with visibility as well as right. um, its relationship to the building itself. Um, in terms of the scale of uh, and when we look at additions, you know, we look at visibility, whether or not there's any significant features being removed. And then we sort of look at the scale of the addition relative to the scale of the building to which it's being added. And in the case of combining buildings, we've also looked for a distinction in design to represent the individuality of the two buildings. We have not historically or generally as a practice looked at the context of other rear yard additions when the addition is for all intents and purposes not visible from a public way. So that, you know, that relative heights of additions to other additions in the block or their massing is something that we haven't really um, applied to our, our review as uh, in, for rooftop additions in the past. Thanks. The drawing Eric. on the left may be more telling <laughs> in that it's an elevation drawing and shows the height of the addition at 83 relative to our addition. And you can also see the addition on uh, 77, I guess it is there. So we're, you know, in similar heights, you know, to those additions. The one on the drawing on the right as a perspective inevitably pushes the addition on 83 farther south, mm -hmm. and therefore it looks shorter than it is. And if you go one farther over, you get that bonker <clears throat> on, on Bleecker Street. Got it. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, Commissioner Chapin. 
Yeah, uh, I think it's fair to say that you have a lot of experience in this area. And I'd just like you to comment on um, your comfort level with regard to excavation of the cellar in this case, in these uh, buildings, uh, you know, thank um, you. Uh, Stephen, I can speak to that. Um, you Good. know, we we renovated a house uh, about five years ago that's within this donut where we almost completely excavated the rail yard. So I, I'd say not only do we have quite a bit of experience, we have quite a bit of experience in this exact donut with very similar conditions. I mean, that house actually occurs in the precedent images <laughs> earlier. Uh, and um, I think it's a house of which we are quite proud. It's a uh, it's turned out very beautifully. No, we've excavated uh, as and Tori from Silman's office is here, but we've worked with Silman. We've worked with the same geotech engineers for twenty five years, and right. we've never had a problem with the excavations. We're very very mm -hmm. careful, and they're all monitored, and you know they. It has belts, suspenders, and God knows what else to hold everything up. So, and I'll also I, note I, that our, the LPC engineer has reviewed all of the drawings as well and has signed off. Thank you. All right, other questions? All right, I don't see any other questions at this time. So let's move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Thank you, Chair Carroll. We received a couple of signups in advance. So we will be going through those first. The first of which is Lucy Levine from Historics District Council. So Lucy Levine, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good, <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HDC finds the massing of this rear yard extension to be appropriate in scale and context. However, we find the single ribbon of glass along the garden elevation to be inappropriate as it does nothing to suggest the fact that the buildings were formerly separate and are now combined. We believe the architect could develop a scheme that achieves the undoubtedly desired visual connection to the garden while somehow acknowledging the original separation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Lucy. Levine. Uh, next up, we'll be hearing from Anna Markham from Village Preservation. So mm -hmm. Anna Markham, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please state your name for the record and unmute your line, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anna Markham and I'm speaking on behalf of Village Preservation today. While we agree with CB2 that the front facade renovation is sensitive, the rest of the application is a little sparse on the actual visual impact of the rooftop addition from the public right of way. Um, images of the mock-up seem to be taken from a significant distance and at strange angles. The rear facade, as is unfortunately commonplace in applications of this nature, has an aggressive amount of fenestration that should be reconsidered. Overall, Village Preservation does not believe that there is enough information in this application about the visual impact to make a decision on it today. We urge the applicant to create more, to create more thorough visual studies and return to the commission at a later date. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I believe those are all the hands we have raised. So I will just note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 2 recommends approval. And we also received one letter from an individual in opposition. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gregory. So uh, would uh, Stephen and Aaron and team, would you like to respond to any of the comments we've heard? I sure, would. maybe I'll maybe I'll just start off by saying, Stephen, that the, the mock-up is complete. Um, there is a very limited window of visibility. I'm not sure which um, angles um, Anna was speaking to, but it is a, a approximately a, a 15 foot 
stretch um, along Bleecker Street where there's visibility of the uh, of the chimney extensions. And then as you walk north, um, you lose it at the oblique angle and you start to get the, the full run of, as, as shown in, I think photos B and C show that in, in context. So it's really that very limited area just south of Charles Street where, where you have any visibility and there's no visibility from uh, the, the north or, or the east. Um, and then I would just touch on the the the, um, the uh, design of the the basement level, um, and um, I think you know this all occurs at the basement level below the level of the of the walls that surround all of the rear yards. So it's not visible from from the um, uh, ad adjoining properties. And um, this is very much a varied context in this nook of the of the. Um, of the block and that we don't, um, we have maintained a consistency in the approach in terms of the um, overall composition, that two building reading all the way through the building. And it's in this one limited location at the basement level where there is a, a continuous uh, window system, um, which has no impact on the overall composition in the donut. Um, and I think, um, I don't know if, it, it, Stephen, do you have more to add in terms of the, the overall design? The only thing I would point out a bit is that although that entire ground floor is a series of glazed uh, sort of openings, there is a column in the middle. If you draw a line from that leader straight down, you mm -hmm. will find that there is a big mullion at that point. These are inevitably within the nature of these drawings. They do not show the depth of those uh, pieces of steel, but that is an not insignificant piece of steel in the middle. So in theory, you could separate the houses and, and give half to one and half to the other. So we didn't put a void in the center, which as I'm sure Commissioner Bland would remember from the classical language of architecture, uh, in a house that you're combining, you typically put a void in the center. You don't put a column in the center. There's a long history of center columns from Alberti to, uh, uh, to Robert Venturi. Okay, thank you. All right, any other final comments or questions from the commissioners? All right, I think we'll move to our discussion now. So I'm sending you I think you have to move to close it, don't you? Yep, <laughs> I am. Okay, all right, Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, and Commissioner Lutfi, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And, um, you know, while we saw this uh, proposal in a very comprehensive way with the front and the rear facades and, of course, the roof, uh, I do want to note that all of the work at the front facade is restorative and uh, eligible for staff level permits or meets the rules in other ways. So, um, we are not actually commenting on the front facade work today. We're looking at the rooftop additions uh, because of the minimal visibility from that one uh, view corridor of the chimneys and uh, because they are being uh, proposed in the in conjunction with rooftop uh, rear yard additions. And we're looking at the cumulative effect of the additions as well as um, the combining and the excavation and of course the, the reconstruction uh, and fenestration of the rear facades. So we'll begin our discussion. Uh, Vice Chair Bland, would you like to start this one? Um, sure. Um, first of all, compliments to a very, very clear and articulate presentation. So I really appreciated that. Even though it was long, it was uh, comprehensive and I think covered all the, all the points. Um, you know, these, these uh, combination of houses is a little unsettling, frankly, but it's a social issue, totally not, um, or in this case, I think not uh, a significant architectural issue. So I think therefore this is um, really um, very well, very well done. Um, the differentiation of the two houses um, in the rear is well done except Alberti, uh, not, notwithstanding, 
I would uh, not rely on just a, a widened steel mullion there at the separation. I would, in, in fact, have a little bit of masonry right in there, um, Stephen. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think I can accept all of this uh, as appropriate and, and from my point of view, quite elegant as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi? Yeah, I, I wanna, uh, I just wanna mirror <laughs> Greg's uh, discomfort <laughs> with, it's not really only this project, it's just, it's really what's going on in the whole neighborhood. It's, and it's this particular neighborhood um, with these combinations that are, um, when you, when you look at them, uh, when when you when we look at them in this way, but also when you walk through the district and you think about what's there, it's uh, it's it's unfortunate in a way, but it is what it is because the scale of the whole district is small. It's very contained, and uh, the buildings are the size that they are. So, uh, you know, there's a. a an evolution going on here that um, that that sometimes gives me pause. All that said, I I do really want to compliment the applicant. Um, I overall, not only do I think the presentation was very good, but this uh, bringing together of these two buildings on the outer envelope. And even though we're not commenting on what was done on the inside to maintain uh, the separation. Well, we do, when we are looking at removals of party walls, we do look at that. And so, and we often ask for there to be some new walls to reflect that separation. So to the extent that you can perceive it through the windows, you still read them as separate buildings with a dividing wall. And as the applicants presented, they did do that. Um, which I agree. Yeah. But I agree that they did. And um, I really appreciate it. Um, so that said, and I know we're not commenting on the front facade, but I do think uh, they've done a very good job. Very, the whole project is very, um, uh, the, the applicant has looked at this very thoroughly and uh, they're, I think bringing they've brought to bear the you know the right approach in a very thorough and understated way. The in the front facade, uh, the changes to the front facade demonstrate that, and and also maintain this sense of separation. And uh, and I'm also um, I appreciate the fact that at the top of the building that the only visibility that we really see is of the flues and at a distance and that the slight lowering of the roof helps maintain that lack of visibility. And um, I, I think the, the, the rear facade is done very well in the same way. I, 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 I love Michael uh, Devin Charles suggestion um, and I always thank him for bringing these things up because I certainly wouldn't know that they're possibilities and think that, uh, and I appreciate the fact that, um, Stephen, you uh, said you think it's interesting to look at, and I also think it is. And in addition, I think Fred's recommendation that, you know, possibly just putting a little more race, masonry at the base is a good one. Okay, great, thanks. Commissioner Jefferson. <laughs> ah, this is such a wonderful project. Very well done, very well thought through. I, I do, I had five comments, but I, the front facade, um, the, the, the incredible little detail that the architect has looked at as for example, he's, um, the in-ground garbage cans, which I thought was <laughs> just a wonderful detail. And, and and the storage tank access panels. It, 
very thoughtful and careful. I um I it it's all appropriate, it's all very well done. The only issue I have is the issue of marking. I mean, this has been completely sanitized, the front facade. And yet there was this ghost line of the of of the stoops that was there, and that's going to be gone. And somehow the removal of stoops is such an important part of transition in New York history that perhaps, I'm, I'm not saying you have to do it, but perhaps that could be an interesting ghost, but it's up to the architect. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Gustafson. Yeah, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with uh, Commissioner Bland's comments, um, and, and in particular, the um, the addition of masonry. So um, otherwise, it, I think it's completely appropriate. Thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, I, too, think that, as ever, um, this architect knows how to how to do this kind of work. And it's um, it's very well done. It's very appropriate. But this is the first project that we've seen in the village um, by this team um, where I actually think that the result, you know, this what they're imagining here for the rear yard is while being appropriate from a um, sort of sense of the place, you know, this is not, this is not, a, a, since it is not entirely visible, and so does not impact the district that that way. Our our criteria or our interest in the retention and the sensitivity to the sense of place, the doubling up of this rear yard um, is, in my mind, um, antithetical to the qual to the feeling, to the sense of the village place, and. That is not to say that it's not appropriate and or visible or impacts others, but I think it is wrong. And so I just thought I would say that, but I will, um, as others have, um, approve it because it's not by other standards inappropriate. Yeah, and I mean, I, I also share people's feelings about um, you know the question of combining buildings, um, especially in a city where we need more units and density. Um, but I think you know our purview is really looking at the size scale materiality of the additions. Do they you know rise to a height that overwhelms the building? Do they extend out into the green space in a way that distracts from the green space or overwhelms the adjacent buildings? Does the combination of the additions at, at the top and at the back overwhelm the buildings? And to the, um, you know, does the materiality and fenestration pattern retain the scale and character of the buildings? And so I think it's this question of the separation of the two and how one sees that, because that's, we're looking at it from you know, sort of the architectural perspective and not the sort of philosophical use. Perspective. No, but I wasn't, I wasn't proposing a philosophical or sociological critique. I was actually describing something that, that, that was my um, assessment and, and right. of the actual spatial, architectural, figural, um, yeah. urbanistic, those things. Uh, I, but again, not inappropriate, just in my mind, yeah. a misreading of the place. I mean, I do think if they were two individual buildings, they might each come in with two-story rear yard additions. And we might even ask them to align. I mean, as we often do ask them to align with their neighbors. And so um, this may be other than, than a, a real um, distinction in the line of the masonry between the two, this may actually be uh, the result of two single applications that came before us. So that's sort of how I look at it in my mind as I sort of struggle with this uh, same issue. Okay, Commissioner Holford-Smith. Yeah, so I struggle with this combination and, and just the general use of these very small buildings to make these very large houses. Um, but I know that's not our purview is just found it very disturbing. Um, but I do think that the additions are too tall for me. They seem to overwhelm. Um, and I, I don't think anyone else has that, that problem. 
but um, that is my comment. Um, and I think um, Everardo brought up a really interesting word, which is sanitizing. And I, I think that's also something that's I find disturbing is the need to make things look perfect. Whereas these are, you know, old buildings and they should they should read their age. They shouldn't look like pristine new buildings. Um, so I would actually think leaving some of the scars of the past is preferable to sanitizing them. Um, but again, nothing that they're doing is inappropriate, so I can vote for it. Just not too happy about it. Okay. Commissioner Chapin. Commissioner Chapin, are you there? Just have to unmute. Yes, I, I agree with uh, a lot of the comments of uh, my colleagues. Uh, it's unfortunate that these combinations of buildings take place, but that's really not within our purview. And I think that uh, this architect uh, has done a, taken a very appropriate design approach uh, to distinguish the buildings in a sensitive and way, which is quite well done. Uh, the issue about retaining uh, some of the ghosting features is, uh, you know, interesting, but again, not required, obviously, under our, our purview. Um, I, I actually agree that the ground floor uh, level windows in the back will not be uh, the fact that they're not di distinguished between the two buildings that much perceptibly would not really be noticeable uh, beneath the side walls and aren't an issue really, though, you know, a ten, a thin, some kind of thin masonry separation uh, would be better in plan. I also had some concern about the size of the rooftop addition on the one uh, building, but after the discussion earlier uh, about it, I think that it is appropriate in the context. So basically I can approve this as presented. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> um, yeah, and, and as with Jean, the the sociological move um, here it gives me pause as well. But um, we have nothing to do with that until the next revolution, I guess. Um, nevertheless, I think that the approach here has been sensitive. These folks know what they're doing. Um, with regard to the addition on the rear, um, Alberti's been dead for over 500 years. This is a contemporary addition to this building, which won't be seen by anyone um, in the surrounding area because there's a fence around it. I don't think there needs to be a separation on this contemporary addition. So, um, but whatever the uh, majority feels is, is appropriate. I, I do appreciate that they will consider um, flipping those bricks on the, on the outside and, and get rid of the thorough seal. Great. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I love the uh, comments uh, from my fellow colleagues. Uh, between starting the next revolution or leaving behind scars, uh, I hope I can remove those from my body. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, you, you're in the hands of a very capable architect uh, and their team, uh, excellent presentation. Um, I, I agree with the uh, comments from my colleagues about the social phenomenon, um, but uh, Commissioner Devonshire did a great job by uh, suggesting the, the reversal of the brick to, to the from back to front. Do you have a feeling about the the adding of whether or not to add masonry at the ground floor of the rear facades? Uh, I would defer that to the majority. Okay. Well, I think it's a little bit split right now, but I can ask some of the others who haven't commented on it specifically. Commissioner Holford Smith, did you have a feeling about that? I don't think it's necessary. And uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron, did you have thoughts about, I know you have other 
thoughts generally about the separation and the distinguishing sort of uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I just have thoughts about standing at that island and looking out onto that rear yard yeah. and not having any sense whatsoever that I am in the village. Okay. Greenwich Village. <laughs> um, so, here no here. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. you know, that's that's the only feeling I have. Masonry or not. Okay. And Commissioner Jefferson, did you have a feeling about the, the peer? Not, not required. Not required. Okay. So, one, two, three, four, five. I actually think we have six who would not require it. I also feel that because it's at the ground level behind the stone, the, the fences and walls that separate the gardens and um, not gonna be visible even from the neighbors uh, that I think it's fine as is. So I think- um, Sarah, I, I will, move, my, my thought was so marginal anyway, I will move my, my position to be that with the majority on that issue. Okay, all right, great. Good, so I think um, we can make a motion to approve it with the condition that they um, ex uh, uh, explore removing and salvaging the brick and flipping it for the reconstruction of the top floor of the rear facades, the top two floors of the rear facades. So Commissioner Devonshire, would you make that motion? Okay, hold please. Um. In the matter of 79 and 81 Charles Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District, an application to combine the buildings, construct rooftop and rear yard additions, and excavate the cellar and rear yard, I recommend approval, finding that the removal of existing rear additions and construction of the proposed rooftop and rear yard additions will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features that the cumulative effect of the added volume of the proposed rooftop and rear yard additions will not overwhelm the building and surround the buildings in the block, that the proposed rear additions will not eliminate a rear yard or diminish the central green space, that the simple design and material materiality of the rear yard additions featuring brick cladding and punch window and door openings will harmonize with the historic building that the installation of a new central downspout at the reconstructed rear facade and wider pier and separate corbelled cornices at the rear addition will differentiate the two buildings from each other, thereby maintaining the historic and subtle delineation of the two properties. That the historic corbelled cornice and window openings at the top floor of the rear facades will be construct reconstructed in kind, thereby maintaining these features of the building's original rear facade that the fenestration and solid to void ratio of the rear facade and the addition will maintain the scale and character of the row houses, thereby helping to retain harmonious with its context. That the proposed one-story rooftop addition stair bulk at HVAC equipment will be set back from the front and rear facades, thereby helping to maintain a sense of the building's original massing. That the proposed rear yard and rooftop additions will not be visible from the public thoroughfares and that only the rooftop chimney extensions at 79 Charles will be partially visible at an oblique angle when viewed from east on Bleecker Street. That the materials and finishes of the proposed rooftop additions featuring metal cladding, metal glass and window door assemblies at 79 Charles Street and stucco and multi-light metal and glass window assemblies at 81 Charles Street will be in keeping with a variety of treatments found at additions within the block, including contemporary rooftop additions at adjacent buildings in the row. That the proposed excavation to extend the cellar level and regrading the lower yard, lower the yard will not diminish the special character of the special green space, sorry, central green space that the excavation and underpinning will be done in compliance with the DOB regulations under the supervision of a licensed structural engineer to protect the building's facades and adjacent buildings, that the applicant will attempt to salvage and re, re, um, reset the bricks, uh, which are covered essentially at this point by thorough seal and reassemble the rear walls in that manner. 
and the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building in the Greenwich Village Historic District. Thank you. All right. And Vice Chair Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All right. Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Samir Baer? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? <clears throat> Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Gustafsson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. With 10 in favor, none opposed, motion passed. All right. So that's Thank you, approved. commissioners. Thank you. And please continue to work with the staff as you uh, assess the condition of the brick and develop the plan to reuse it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. We'll now move to public hearing item number three, LPC 22-06302 an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 632, lot 30. This is uh, 131 Charles Street House, individual landmark, also in the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension. It's a federal style row house built in 1834 with a back house. And the application is to construct a dormer and rear yard addition, alter facades, eliminate a passageway and excavate the cellar and rear yard. Commissioners, the uh, applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, Jackie, you now have control of the slides. You may begin. Great, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, hi. Uh, hello, commissioners and landmark staff. Happy New Year, it's good to see you all again. Thank you for hearing our application today. Uh, my name is Jackie Pudu vallon preservation consultant on the project. Um, I'm standing, um, standing by to answer questions are the architect, James Sacecorn of the Turret Collaborative, the engineers Robert Bellardi of Plan B Engineering, Steve Nigerian of Severud, <clears throat> excuse me, and Tanmay Sankey of GZA. Uh, we're also here today with the owner, Ben Shaul, who would like to make some brief remarks before I begin the presentation. Ben, please introduce yourself. Hi, this is uh, Ben Shaul. I thank you all for taking the time to meet us today, um, Commissioner and Landmark staff. Um, I'm the owner of the property at uh, 131 Charles Street. I am also the owner of the property at 129 Charles Street, which is next door. It is a home I share with my wife and my four children and our two dogs. I renovated 129 Charles Street, a former stable building under the direction of LPC and it's uh, a consultation with the village preservation. My architect, Wayne Tourette, met with Andrew Berman a village preservation and welcome his, his quote because I want to do a sensitive renovation. I purchased 131 Charles Street in 2018 for my family's use and with the same ob uh, objectives. I respect and appreciate the history of this house. I'm also a big Diane Arbus fan and have some of her works. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to own one of her former houses, um, that being the back house. As much as I appreciate the history of 131, I also recognize that the house has challenges that I'm hoping to alleviate with my uh, construction renovation of the house. The house's lot sits between two much taller buildings. Consequently, it's always dark in both the main house and the back house. I like to have larger windows on both houses to allow more light. The, the bottom of the main house uh, is, is extremely dark, and that's why we propose a one-story horizontal extension with glass doors, and that's why we're, we're proposing the French doors on, on the floor above on the back house. We'd also like to join the house and the, the, the front house and the back house underground to have more living space. Um, I am a, a, a professional real estate developer for uh, 26 years. I understand the, the delicacy of excavation and the necessary measures on how to protect buildings, foundations, and neighboring properties. I've developed over 100 buildings in Manhattan, <laughs> including conversions and, and, and renovations of existing landmark buildings, such as 140 West Street, the 32-story Art Deco building, which is an individual landmark um, located down by the trade site. My team of engineers and contractors are extremely thorough 
with a orientation, and we've all worked together for almost 20 years on projects, all successfully. They prepared all the necessary support of excavation plans and means and methods and monitoring plans, all things which we've done on every single new building which we've ever built in any district, landmark or not landmark. If anyone can do this job right, it's a professional real estate developer who lives next door with his family. Safety, as well as construction means and methods, have been the pillars of my company's success. My wife and my children obviously raised that bar to, to even a higher level. The excavation and the construction that is being proposed here has been, has been implemented successfully by hundreds of building owners in Manhattan. I thank you all for your consideration on this application and hope that you look favorably upon it. Thank you, Ben. Um, as previously stated, this project is 131 Charles Street, an 1834 Federal Row House. It is an individual landmark and it is located in the Greenwich Village uh, Historic District Extension. The proposal at the front facade, which you see here all the way on the left, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is to seal the entrance to the horse walk, which currently has a door at the opening, and to install a, fa a false door. At the rear, the proposal is uh, to install a shed dormer at the roof, construct a one-story addition at the cellar level with a, a large glazed opening, excavating a portion of the rear yard in front of that addition, creating a terraced rear yard, and installing uh, French doors at the first floor. And at the back house, the proposal is to install French doors at the ground floor and to construct a stairway bulkhead at the roof and to install other mechanical equipment, in, including condensers, railings. Um, the proposed work also includes excavating a new subcellar under the entire lot, which will connect the two houses. Here's the house located on the district map. Here on top is the block elevation showing you the house uh, in context with its much larger neighbors. And on bottom is a photo montage showing you what the south side of the, the block looks like. Here's the house in its existing condition in context within the streetscape. To the right is 129 Charles Street, a former stable building, which is home to the owner of 131 Charles. And this is an axonometric view looking west showing the existing and proposed conditions. Here you can see the dormer at the roof of the main house, the lowering and terracing of the, of the courtyard, the changes to the openings at the ground floor of the back house, and the stair bulkhead, mechanicals, and railings on top of its roof. And you can also see the excavation of the, the subcellar connecting the two buildings. And this axonometric view is looking east, showing the existing and proposed conditions. Here you're looking at uh, the changes at the back of the main house, the dormer at the roof, the one-story addition at the cellar, the installation of the French doors at the first floor. Um, and again, you're also seeing the lowering and terracing of the courtyard and the proposed mechanicals on top of the, the back house. Incidentally, none of this work is visible from any public thoroughfare. Here are some historic photos of the house from 1928, the 1940s, and designation in 2006. Note that in the photos from the early 20th century, there is a solid door at the horse walk entrance. Here are some historic maps, <clears throat> excuse me, that show us how this block developed over time. By the mid 19th century, the house shows up on the map as a four story masonry, up here, as a four story masonry structure with a wood structure in the back, probably a stable. <clears throat> By the late 19th century, the two-story back house is constructed, which you see here in this 1895 map. By the early 20th century, all of the neighboring houses have been replaced by much larger buildings with commercial uses, which is in keeping with the development of this part of the West Village overall. Small houses that were, were originally built for middle-class tradespeople and merchants in the early 19th century gave way to commercial structures on combined lots, such as garages, stables, warehouses, and on this block, the police station on the lot just to the west. Here on this color-coded plan, you can see how the heights of the surrounding buildings compare to 131 Charles. To the right is a building that is 50, uh, 50 feet tall and extends to the rear of the lot. 
To the left is a building that is 66 feet tall. And behind 131 Charles is a building that is 138 feet tall. Here's an aerial view of the block that demonstrates how diminutive and penned in 131 Charles is to the larger buildings within its block. This creates a canyon effect in the rear yard that makes it very dark inside of both houses. Um, switching focus now to the actual proposed work on the house. Um, these are photos of existing conditions at the front facade. The center photo is the existing doorway to the horse walk. The proposal here is to seal this entrance so that it becomes a false door with a solid wood paneled door. On the left is the existing condition elevation drawing for the front facade and on the right is the proposed condition. You'll note the oval window above the horse walk, which is currently blocked with brick, is going to be restored. This is staff level work. I just wanted to explain to you what you're seeing here in the proposed elevation. Below the elevation drawings are sections through the horse walk. On the left is the existing section through the horse walk and on the right is the proposed section horse walk. Um, here, note here, you'll see this is the front of the house and the proposed rear uh, bump out at the back of the house. Here's the rear facade of the main house, existing conditions. You can see in the photo on the left that canyon-like condition I, re I referenced which makes it very hard to get light into this house, uh, given its, its smaller window openings as well. The middle photo, um, the middle photos are below grade um, area way in front of the cellar. And the photo on the right is that horse walk packet, passage uh, looking towards the street. <clears throat> um, and here's some existing and proposed um, rear facade elevations. In 2020, a permit was issued for the installation of a platform lift at the rear facade of the main house. That work is no longer intended to be to be done, but we're just showing you a previous approval here on the left. Um, the existing elevation at center highlights in red the areas proposed for removal. At right is the proposed rear facade. This elevation shows the proposed subcellar, the one-story horizontal addition with wood and glass doors, the three French doors at the first floor leading out to that, that terrace created by the addition, and the shed dormer at the roof with multi-light casement windows. Now, here's the back house, uh, whose facade I think may have been changed over time, but I've not been able to find uh, real proof on that. Um, this may be conjecture, but I think the position of the center window at the second floor means that this had been a hayloft opening um, and if this house used to be as, used as a stable, then it stands to reason that the first floor opening would have had to have been larger to accommodate getting a horse in and out. Um, but again, I, I'm just not sure on that one. Here on the left is the existing elevation of the back house with the area of, uh, to be removed uh, highlighted in red. On the right is the proposed condition with the facade elongated with the lowering of the grade the new French doors with transoms, the stairway bulkhead at the roof, as well as railings and mechanical equipment. And here's an axonometric view looking east, showing you the proposed work at the rear of the main house, the excavation of the subcellar, the lowering and terracing of the interior courtyard, and the proposed mechanical equipment on top of the back house. You saw this earlier. Here's the existing section looking east, showing you the areas of change in red. And here's the proposed section looking east, showing the elimination of the horse walk, the one-story addition, the subcellar, uh, new subcellar, the terracing of the courtyard, the elongating of the back house's ground floor, and the mechanical equipment on top of the back house. And here's the axonometric view again, looking west, showing you the proposed work at the back house, um, highlighted in red again as the areas of removals. Um, so you're seeing the excavation of the subcellar, lowering and terracing of the interior courtyard, proposed mechanical equipment on top of the back house, and again, the, the shed dormer proposed on the back of the main house. Here's the existing section looking west, showing you in red the areas of change. And here's the proposed section looking west, um, showing again the one-story addition, 
the new subcellar, the lowering and terracing of the courtyard, the elongating of the back house's ground floor, and the mechanical equipment on top of the back house. Note that the red dotted line indicates the level, current level of the courtyard grade. Um, the rear yard will be uh, lowered by uh, five to seven feet at the front and approximately four feet toward the back under the new proposal. Uh, next, I'll be showing you some site sections to show you the proposed subcellar in relation to adjacent buildings. This is the site section looking east. Here's the proposed subcellar in relation to the adjacent buildings looking north. Here is the view looking north through the main house. And um, next, I'll be showing you the addition, um, showing you additional site sections that explain the extent of underpinning that will be done. This is uh, the site section looking west with the red area indi indicating the underpinning under 133 Charles Street. This is the site section looking north showing the underpinning under 132 Perry Street. And this is the site so section looking east showing the underpinning under 129 Charles Street. And now switching gears um, to talk about district precedents. And here are two federal style houses with pitched roofs that feature shed dormers with multi-light casement windows. These houses are 61 Perry Street and 77 Bedford Street. Obviously these dormers are on the front of the house so that we can see them and get photographs of them. And this is 123 Washington Place, which is an example of a rear addition approved that included creating a terraced garden that was lowered by roughly five feet. This work was approved by LPC in 2014. And this is nine St. Luke's Place, which is also an example of a rear addition approved that included creating a terraced garden that was lowered by about five feet. This work was approved in 20, 2022. Uh, these are the previous existing and proposed sections for that approval at nine St. Luke's Place, showing the extent of excavation that was approved um, almost to the rear lot line um, under the backyard, which you see here. Uh, this is 263 West 12th Street, a house with a back house that received LPC approval in 2008 uh, for altering the facade of the back house. The top photos are from the 1990s and the photos on the bottom are from 2008. You can see the commission approved altering the non-visible portion of the facade of the back house. This is 157 West 12th Street, a house and back house that are connected underground by a cellar. You can see that noted here on the cellar plan that I, I pulled off the web. Um, and this is 340 West 12th Street, which received a certificate of appropriateness to remove its horse walk while retaining the door to that horse walk at the front facade as part of a proposal to construct a rear addition and to construct a full lot below grade addition connecting the main house to the back house as we are proposing for 131 Charles today. Here you see the facade in its previous condition and its back house, in these photos on the left. You'll note the door at the front of the house. Um, yeah, you'll note the door at the front of the horsewalk pack passage. Uh, the elevation on the left shows the rear facade in its previous condition. And on the right is the approved rear elevation and excavation. And here on the previous uh, and approved sections for 340 West 12th Street, which shows the removal of the horse walk and the underground connection between the main house and the back house by excavating the cellar. Again, this was, um, this was uh, recently approved. Okay. Um, oh, let me go back a second. I just wanted to mention that one of the findings for this permit was that the approved work will not cause the removal of any significant historic fabric or architectural features of the building or the rear yard. Uh, this is 61 Bank Street, which um, the designation report noted as having a horse walk at the time of designation and which has since been altered with LPC approval. You can see in the photo on the right, this zoom in over here um, of the doorway at the former horse walk where there's now a stairway going down. And 
And this is 250 West 10th Street, which the designation report also noted as having a horse walk at the time of designation and which has since been altered. Um, LPC staff was not able to find a permit for an alteration to the horse walk, but you can see the floor plans that I found online. The horse walk has been closed off and is now part of the interior space of this basement floor. Here's the circles correspond to where that doorway is, false door. And lastly, this is 83 Horatio Street, which the designation report noted as having a horse walk at the time of designation and um, has also since been altered with LPC approval. In 2018, a certificate of appropriateness was issued for a rear addition and interior alterations that, in that included removing the horse walk. On this sheet, um, the floor plans uh, from that C of A approval, you can see where the horse walk was and a subsequent change at the basement level. Uh, the findings on that permit included that the proposed work would not eliminate any significant architectural features or historic fabric as well. And now just to show you some renderings for the proposed work, here's the existing and proposed for the front facade. Um, again, I just wanna emphasize, there should really be no change in the appearance of the horse walk from the street, other than you know, this door becoming a false door. This is the existing uh, existing and proposed rear facade of the front building, um, uh, showing Jackie, you how that, yes? Um, I just okay. wanted to make one clarification, uh, actually. So- uh, Introduce in yourself. The, uh, I'm James Sesacorn of the Tourette Collaborative. Um, I did want to make one clarification in the rear yard. Um, our plan mm -hmm. is that the rear terrace is um, lowered by four feet, and the front terrace, which is adjacent to the front building, is lowered by five foot seven inches. Um, so, oh, yeah. sorry. I must have misread <laughs> something. Thank you. That's all right. Thank yeah, you. sorry about that. Thank you for that clarification. Um, now, here's a rendering um, for the changes looking at the back house. And um, I think that's it. That's it. That's our presentation. We welcome any comments or questions, please. Great. Thank you very much. We have a, a number of questions. So we'll start with uh, Vice Chair Bland, followed by Commissioner Holford Smith and Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, Sarah, I know that the applicant just gave us a little bit of a history of some horse walk uh, changes, but I would like if, if you and or Corey would give us a little bit more of fill that out a little bit more for us um you know is there a long history of allowing this or not allowing it etc cetera, etc cetera? um i think that i'll let Corey uh actually speak more about it because i think he's looked at the examples that were uh provided in more detail i haven't looked at studied those um but i think in my memory we have um you know, on uh, we have allowed some modification. We have not seen, uh, not, you know, a tremendous amount of these applications because it is a relatively unique feature. Right. Um, and so I think over time we have allowed some changes and um, in each case, there may be different circumstances. Um, and I, you know, there's also time that allows us to consider those decisions. So. Uh, Corey, do you want to add anything that was specific about these? Yeah. Um, anything else? Yeah. You know, I, I actually worked on the one example, 61 Bank Street, many, many years ago. And, and my recollection of that was that it was one of the horse walks that either was open or had a gate. You could see through it. And the commission approved lowering it, I believe, but maintained a sort of passageway that I believe still allowed some some visibility from front to back through through the replacement gate. I'm not exactly sure what it looks like now, but that's what I remember from that project. And I think in general that reflects the position that you know for these horse walks that maintained openness, where one could see from the street through to the back, either through a gate or perhaps through a door with enough glazing that you could see through it. That the commission has been more protective of those and allowed fewer changes, perhaps not allowing them to be closed off entirely, uh, as opposed to those horse walks that may have existed but were behind solid doors. And I think those are the cases where uh, greater changes have been allowed. And there may be some um, discrepancies here and there from from that, but I think generally speaking, it falls into those two categories uh, from from my from what I recall. Thank you. All right. Okay, Commissioner Holford-Smith. 
Uh, yes, thanks. Um, similar question, are any of the precedent projects that are cited here individual landmarks or are they within the historic district? They are, they are within the historic district, they're not in individual landmarks. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Uh, I just was, and, and I think it's clarified, wanted to know if some any of those other cases um, with horse walk modifications were individual landmarks. And it seems that the examples that have been shown to us are all within historic districts and not individual landmarks. Okay, yes, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes, Chair Carroll, help me out. Um, individual landmarks are not just a facade. Is it not the structures, the whole structure, the two buildings within this yes. particular context? The have... Yeah, the designated site is the entire lot. This also happens to be within a, a historic district, but um, the individual landmark site is the entire lot and, and includes both buildings. So, so changing the rear facade, even though it's not seen from the public thoroughfare, is that because you're changing an individual landmark that's been around 189 years? I mean, it's a long time. Is that is that what we're supposed to be looking at? at the well, let me, I mean, we do approve changes to individual landmarks to allow modern needs. And, um, but I think the difference between an individual landmark and a building within a historic district is that you are looking at the effect of the changes to the architectural character or the reason for which that individual landmark was designated. And when you're looking at changes within, uh, to a building within a historic district, you're looking at the you know, the effect on the building, but also the effect on the larger context in the adjacent buildings. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And and how it relates to the character of the, di of the district as a whole. All right, Commissioner yeah. Latvi? Yeah, I may have missed this, but um, what is the size of this currently of the horse walk in terms of width and height and length? And what is the width of this building? James, would you like to answer that? So, uh, sorry. Good, you're good. Uh, the uh, width of the interior of the horse walk is approximately uh, 36 inches, and the height is a seven foot seven, and roughly. I mean, because it does it does slope slightly to the back, but. Um, uh, overall, the average is seven foot seven. And then the the length of the building and the width of the building. So the length of the building. Let me just. Um, Which would be the length, length of the crosswalk? I mean, the horse walk. Right. Um, just, uh, so the length of the building um, currently is. 34 foot 10 and a half inches. Okay, and the width? And the width is uh, 20, roughly 25 feet. Okay, and that's without the crosswalk or uh, the horse walk, I don't know why I keep saying that. Or is that without it or oh, with it? That includes the horse walk, 25 okay. feet, including the horse walk, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, other questions? <clears throat> All right, I don't see any other questions at this time. So we'll move to public testimony and we may have additional questions after that. So if you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. We will, as always, start with anyone who signed up in advance and then get to everyone else. Um, but whether or not you signed in, just please raise your hand so we can find you as we work through the, the list. And I would ask everyone to respect the uh, three minute um, time limit allowed for testimony so that we can be sure that everybody has a chance and an opportunity to testify on this item. 
Um, I know we have a number of people who've signed up. So I'm going to turn it over to Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Okay. Thank you so much, Chair Carroll. Uh, we received a number of signups in advance, uh, and I see a number of hands raised. So the first we'll be hearing from is Sean Coglin. So Sean, I will be Sean Coglin. I will be promoting you to panelist now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Sean Coughlin and I serve as Chief of Staff to New York City Council Member Eric Botcher. Today I'll be providing joint testimony from Council Member Eric Botcher, New York State Assembly Member Deborah Jaglick, and State Senator Brian Kavanaugh regarding this application, 131 Charles Street, before the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We are pleased to present this testimony as the city and state elected officials representing the West Village neighborhood of Manhattan. We would like to thank the Landmarks Preservation Commission for holding this public hearing today and giving residents an opportunity to testify about this property. Application number LPC-22-06302 seeks to alter the individually landmarked 1834 house and rear house at 131 and 131 and a half Charles Street. 131 Charles Street is one of the most intact examples in New York City of a modest federal style house and was one of our city's first individually designated structures. The new owner is seeking to alter the rear roof and facade of the main structure, eliminate the historic rear horse walk, significantly alter the rear structure and dig a subterranean space connecting the two structures. We support Manhattan Community Board 2's recommendation of denials of permission to alter the windows in the rear facade and rear ground floor, as well as their recommendation that the windows be instead wooden with small panes as historically referenced. We also support their recommendation that the tripartite design in the parlor and the second floor of the main house remain the same and the recommended denial of permission to change the window in the horse walk, as well as the alteration of the aforementioned. We do not believe that these changes are appropriate nor reflect the integrity of this historic structure in the heart of Greenwich Village, and we are hopeful that the commission agrees. We would like to thank the Landmarks Preservation Commission for their careful consideration of this application. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Sean Coughlin. Next up, we'll be hearing from Anna Markham from Village Preservation. So Anna, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Anna Markham and I am speaking on behalf of Village Preservation today. The proposed changes to 131 and 131 and a half Charles Street are deeply alarming and dangerous. We strongly oppose this application. Designated on March 8, 1966, 131 and 131 and a half Charles Street were among New York City's first individual landmarks, designated alongside the Flatiron Building, Grace Church, City Hall, and the Morgan Library. The home was also included in the Far West Village, Greenwich Village Historic District Extension, designated on May 2, 2006. 131 Charles Street is one of the most architecturally intact examples of federal row house architecture in New York City. The architectural significance of the home has been cited in many publications, including Ada Louise Huxtable's Classic New York, Harmon Goldstone's History Preserved, A Guide to New York City's Landmarks and Historic Districts, Charles Lockwood and, and Patrick Chacon's Bricks and Brownstone, both the second and third editions, Kevin Murphy's The Houses of Greenwich Village, and all editions of the AIA Guide to New York City, among many others. 131 and 131 and a half Charles Street also <clears throat> hold great cultural significance as the home of groundbreaking photographer Diane Arbus from 1959 to 1968. Both structures are remarkably intact with original details. The proposed changes to these buildings would significantly alter their architectural integrity. The large openings proposed for the back facade of the main house and the front facade of the stable 
the changes to the rooftops of both houses, as well as the loss of the rear section of the horse walk, would radically diminish the historic fabric as well as the character of these buildings. The excavation of the rear yard in addition of a subterranean structure connecting both houses has the potential to destabilize both of these buildings as well as adjacent historic buildings. Especially in light of the recent nearby loss of 14 Gay Street and the nine row houses at the corner of West 14th Street and 9th Avenue, the most extreme care must be utilized when considering excavation, especially, especially what is in this case completely unnecessary excavation under fragile structures such as these. The potential risks far outweigh the personal benefits to be gained by allowing this incredibly extensive excavation. The proposed changes are completely inappropriate for such an intact iconic example of a structure so near to the heart of Greenwich Village, New York and American history. And the proposed excavation and digging opens up the danger of even greater damage being done to these and other adjacent structures. We strongly urge the commissioners to deny this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. Next up, we'll be hearing from Christina Conroy from VSNY. So Christina, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please state your name for the record and unmute your line, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners. <clears throat> I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society, New York. Now, 131 Charles Street was designated as an individual landmark on April 19th, 1966. Grand Central Terminal was designated as an individual landmark on August 2nd, 1967. Central Park was designated as a scenic landmark on April 16th, 1974. And the Empire State Building was designated as an individual landmark on May 19th, 1981. Now we present this list to emphasize the importance of this building to the history of New York City and to put it into context with the much more massive landmarks which outstrip it in in terms of fame, but not in terms of significance. Commissioners, the designation report for 131 Charles describes this individual landmark as intimate in scale, proportions and details marked by a modest simplicity. It notes that it is a charming late federal brick house of excellent proportion and scale, built of sound materials in the best tradition of craftsmanship. And it ends by stating that 131 Charles represents one of the best examples of the small New York townhouses. Well, the proposal before you today will result in a building apparently designed to get as far away from modesty, simplicity, intimacy, and charm as possible. It is bloated, it is excessive, and it is destructive, eliminating not only original materials, proportions and details, but also the adroit architectural solution, the horse trot, which 19th century builders devised to provide an open access to a back house. Oh, if this proposal is approved, the research department might as well rewrite the designation report to read, it's one of the best examples of the front facade of a small New York townhouse left in place to conceal an early 21st century building. The Victorian Society has often suggested that the applicant work with staff to develop a more appropriate proposal. We will not do so in this case, for we believe there is a basic incompatibility between this important building and the owner's desires. We therefore recommend that this proposal be denied. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. And next up, we will be hearing from Lucy Levine from Historic Districts Council. So Lucy, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record. You will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, commissioners. My name is Lucy Levine, speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. 131 Charles Street is one of New York City's earliest designated individual landmarks and a treasure of federal style row house architecture in Greenwich Village. We feel that a structure of this rarity and import should be altered as little as possible. Though we find the proposed changes to the back house to be modest and respectful, the rear building has a composed courtyard facing facade that we think should be maintained. We note that this building dates to 1834 and is built on land, 
which would make any excavation dangerous and if inexpertly handled, catastrophic. We appreciate that this applicant has been deeply thorough and conscientious in their excavation plans, and we feel that this level of care and rigor should serve as a baseline for any applicant wishing to do excavation work. LPC must enforce this level of compliance in every application. Instead, the commission has allowed more than a dozen landmarked buildings, including 10 in Greenwich Village, to be demolished over the past year alone due to negligence and illegal work. We plan to submit to the LPC a more detailed list of recommendations we believe could help stop this alarming trend. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Lucy. Next up, we'll be hearing from Patrick W. Ciccone, so Patrick Ciccone, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, Patrick Ciccone, are you with us? Yes, yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Sorry, technical technical issues there. My name is Patrick W. Ciccone. I'm the co-author with the late Charles Lockwood of the 2019 edition of Bricks and Brownstone, the New York Row House. 131 Charles Street was constructed in 1834, and 131 and 131 and a half Charles Street were designated together as New York City landmarks in April 1966. The designation within the first year year of the Landmarks Preservation Commission's existence is one of the city's earliest designations of an individual row house, reflecting the importance of this property to the city's history and indeed to the history of historic preservation itself. The landmarks designated that year convey its peers among all city landmarks, not just among houses. City Hall, St. Paul's Chapel, the Municipal Building, the Flatiron Building, Low Library. The esteem this house and its rebuilding have held as intact survivors of an early 19th century lower Manhattan is comparable perhaps only to the Seabury Treadwell House, aka the Merchant's House, on East 4th Street, and they have survived as living residences, not as a museum. And what makes this property truly remarkable is the ensemble of the front house at 131 Charles Street, the horse walk through it, the former stable, now 131 and a half Charles, all legible together. 131 and 131 and a half Charles Street were photographed and illustrated prominently in the 2019 edition of Bricks and Brownstone, showing, showing the integrity of the exteriors and of the interiors. The landmarks law may not protect private interiors, but it does protect buildings. And buildings aren't just exterior walls. Their integrity is dependent on structural and architectural conditions that are not necessarily visible architectural features. This application proposes what's really a physical impossibility that one can remove nearly every structural and architectural component of 131 and 131 and a half Charles Street, look at those sections closely, excavate the entire site, and to do all this destruction and new construction through the Charles Street elevation without any damage to it. There is no way to safely do this without compromising the remaining fragments of the building uh, shown in the plans. So I believe it is fair to say that this is a de facto demolition plan in guise of an alteration, and I'll note that the owner has many previous projects where there's been issues with excavation, DOB issues, et cetera, uh, to, to provide further light on that. Even if this proposed work were somehow technically possible, however, the design represents the antithesis of historic preservation and of the protections that land the buildings are afforded through their landmark status. The, wor the word facadectomy is rightly pejorative term for this approach, leaving only the street facing elevation, the face of a building intact, while placing a new and different body behind. But this term still implies some sort of necessary medical procedure, rather than as in this case, what would be ultimately a more violent and wanton act. Indeed, the gruesome nature of this application is perhaps best served by a movie reference rather than an architectural one, namely the scene from The Silence of the Lambs where Hannibal Lecter wears the bloodied severed face of a victim as his own. Doing anything but denying this application outright would be contrary to the very purpose and integrity of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick Ciccone. And next up, we'll be hearing from Zach Weinstein. So Zach Weinstein, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Yes, can you hear me? Is my microphone working? Yes, I can hear you. 
Great. Yes, my name is Zach Weinstein. I was co-chair of the Greenwich Village Community Task Force, which was one of the organizations that led the landmark campaign, which led to the this extension of the Greenwich Village Historic District. Um, just to, again to emphasize the central importance of this structure, the book that we had, just adjust the camera there, when it, a book that we put together to um, promote the historic importance of this extension included and featured uh, a page on 131 Charles Street. Um, I briefly, I do agree with all of the uh, objections that have been raised by the previous speakers about the aesthetic and historical inappropriateness of these proposed uh, changes in the, in the building. However, what I would personally like to emphasize is that Landmarks Preservation Commission and departments of buildings simply do not currently have the ability to ensure that the structural work, the extensive structural work that's being proposed for these buildings um, can be done in a, in a way that will not harm the integrity of the structures. We've just gone through the debacle at 4454 Ninth Avenue, where nine 1840s houses were demolished following uh, you know, structural and foundation work that were approved by LPC and DOB. Uh, we are just dealing with the demolition of 14 Gay Street, where again, the foundation work that was approved by uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission has led to the demolition of the structure. I'd like to point out one further example at 777 Washington Street, the old Albert Watson Studios, where in April 2008, LPC approved foundation work. Um, following year, the building collapsed and was demolished. Uh, and we, we simply cannot afford to continue losing historic structures in this area. And we cannot afford to continue replacing historic structures with Disney-fied recreations of facades, which is what happens when, uh, found, when, when these uh, initial applications turn out to have structural issues that neither DOB nor LPC is properly identifying and, which, and uh, when demolition then follows. So uh, again, I believe this application is inappropriate. And I believe that it is unfortunately uh, misleading to, pres to, um, uh, to present this as anything other than uh, fundamental changes to the structures of the building. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach Weinstein. Next up, we'll be hearing from Lisa Moretti. So Lisa Moretti, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please Unmute your line and state your name for the public record. You will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello? Hi, yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Um, I represent a lot of the unit owners of a landmark neighbor and we have a lot of concerns that the proposed work will harm the historic nature of the street and that we have particular concerns that the proposed excavation may harm the structure of the other landmark buildings as well as the new mechanical, the noise of the new mechanical equipment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa Moretti. And uh, next up, we'll be hearing from Pamela Wolf. So Pamela Wolf, I'll be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Well, uh, are you with us, Pamela? Hello, I, I am with you. I've lost, um, I can't see myself, so I'm hoping you can see me <clears throat> and, and you can hear me. Is that yes, true? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. So please go ahead. Thank you. I am Pamela Wolf, president of Save Chelsea. Save Chelsea opposes this project. While it falls outside our neighborhood, its approval would add another inappropriate precedent for the destructive transformation of row houses, currently the greatest threat to the integrity of the Chelsea Historic District. In its excavation of a new story below the entire site and elimination of its historic horse walk, 
This project painfully recalls the LPC approved proposal to obliterate the substance of Chelsea's oldest house in 2016. It also recalls the disastrous super basement LPC approved for 4850 West 69th Street in the Upper West Side Central Park West Historic District. The, disrupt, the disrupt, dis, disruptive construction of which drove neighbors to move away. The risky undercutting of all of 131 and 131 and a half Charles Street is especially inadvisable when the commission is under fire for the loss of 10 supposedly protected row houses to claims of structural instability. This project would change the fundamental character of the two houses. They would no longer even be discrete buildings. The endearingly quirky and informal rear yard facades of both buildings would be lost to standard issue elevations of the sort LPC has curated and sanctioned in its track record of approval. These buildings would be highly sought after for their original purpose and vitally used without the proposed changes. In routinely approving such wholesale transformations, the commission drives the price of historic row houses out of reach for those who might value them for what they are and preserve them. There is no benefit to true historic preservation in this. Projects like this are not alterations. They are new development hidden behind and below what is visible from the street. We call on LPC to stop turning historic row houses into development sites starting with this proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. And next up, we'll be hearing from Michael Flores. So Michael Flores, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. I'm sorry, are we there? Where, are we on now? Yes, we could hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am a neighbor who abuts the, uh, the, you said property. And as mentioned earlier, our concerns are uh, with the excavation to the uh, integrity of, of our building. Uh, we are currently uh, completing local law 11 work. And uh, we are concerned that the additional construction next door uh, will inhibit our ability uh, to complete that work. Uh, also, I agree with all the other panelists uh, and respondents who have talked about the, the issues with the historical nature of the building. Uh, my question I would have is that with all the proposed changes, does the building lose its, its historical uh, uh, registration? Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And next up, we'll be hearing from Jeremy Lexin. So Jeremy Lexin, I will be promoting you to a panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jeremy Lexon, the chair of the Brooklyn Heights Association Landmarks Committee. I'm speaking in opposition to this application and in favor of maintaining the integrity of the city's individual landmark designations. The commission should not agree to the justifications presented by this proposal. The so-called precedents of approved alterations in the various Greenwich Village historic districts aren't relevant here. Individual landmarks by definition need to be considered standing on their own. Most of the alterations here would diminish the distinction that led to this property being designated as an individual landmark in the first place. In particular, losing the horse walk would be a cavalier removal of one of the property's most distinctive elements. The passageway itself is integral to the house's character. It's not just about the door. Any house can have more than one door to get inside, or even a fake door. 
The whole point of this door in the context of this individual landmark designation is to get to its back house. If the horse walk even on an individual landmark isn't preserved, then the few remaining in the city are all endangered. From the vantage of Brooklyn Heights, the part of New York City with the largest concentration of federal style houses outside the village and surrounding Manhattan neighborhoods, it would be alarming indeed if the commission didn't vigorously protect the elements of our earliest architectural heritage like horse walks. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And next up, we will be hearing from Lisa Sternheim. So Lisa Sternheim, I will be promoting you to panelist right now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the public record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, Lisa Sternheim, are you with us? Hello, are you able Hi. to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hi, I too am a neighbor of um, 129 and 131 Charles Street. And while my building manager and a fellow neighbor spoke regarding the impact on the building, which will have serious consequences uh, regarding I, our- I, I'm sorry, if you could please uh, state your name for the record. I'm sorry. Lisa, Lisa Sternheim. Can I continue? Yes, yes. You can continue. Okay, Thanks. so I too am a neighbor um, of 129 and 131 Charles, and you heard from my building manager and my fellow neighbor, Michael Flores. Um, in addition to their comments, I'm, I am concerned about the structural impact on our building when you're going to uh, look to dig below the surface. We too are a very old building. We are landmarks. Um, noted and we have complied through very various work that we've done in our building. I do wanna highlight for several of the people out there that this building was purchased from um, Judith Stonehill, whose husband was also a preservationist architect. And she wrote a, bill, a book about the West Village and she worked on the Historical Preservation Society. And I think the irony of taking a building that is cherished to the level that it is and trying to make it into something that it was never designed to be is really a slap in the face to all the people who work to comply with all landmarks requirements, as arduous as they are. And we've had our own challenges in our own building, but we understand and respect the value of it. And I would like that to be considered, that we're taking a building that was documented by a historian who wrote a book about this immediate neighborhood and now is going to be decimated by work for someone, by, with someone who has no value for what the neighborhood stands for. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your uh, testimony. And I believe that is all the testimony that we have. I see no further hands raised. So I will note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 2 recommends approval of the excavation, provided that all regulations are followed to prevent harm to the property and neighboring properties, approval of the rear dormer structure and rooftop, denial of the windows in the rear facade, the rear dormer, and in the rear house ground floor, and recommends that they instead be wooden, historically referenced with small panes, and in the parlor and second floors of the main house be punched, tripartite design remains. Denial of the change of the windows in the horse walk door and which is visible through the window from the sidewalk and is of special importance to this individual landmark. Further, we received a campaign of 209, 291 forum emails that were sent to us in opposition and two letters from individuals were sent to us in support. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I wanna thank everyone for their testimony. I do want to, before I turn it back to the applicant, just uh, respond to the testimony by the Historic Districts Council and just say for the record that LPC has not allowed or permitted the demolition of houses. 
um, and the 10 houses in this historic district really re refers to two incidents. And in each of those cases, DOB found that the conditions at the building were either due to contractor negligence and illegal work or inherent pre-existing structural issues um, required undermine the facades and required the demolition to protect public safety. So those were um, DOB findings and orders. Uh, LPC did not approve them. We worked very closely as we do with all of our properties that are uh, aging and distressed uh, to and, and being uh, you know, neglected, we work very hard to attempt to stop that. And so just for the record, I wanted to note that. I also wanted to note that, um, you know, this as we do with all applications for work that have structural impact on, potential structural impact on our designated buildings, we have our LPC engineer review it for us. And I wanted to note for the record that our engineer, Don Friedman of Old Structures, um, has reviewed these structural plans. And while he found that the plan is feasible if designed and built properly, um, he did note that this is a very old building where there are more inherent risks. So we will consider that as well as um, the testimony, as well as all of our own past uh, uh, positions and actions as we carefully review the work on this individual landmark and, and our work will be rigorous, our review will be rigorous as it always is. So with that, I would like to turn Sarah? it back. Yes. Sarah, I, and also, I just think it's important for the for the public who's listening and the record to remind everybody, because we heard a bunch of this in the context of the testimony, that the Landmarks Law does not uh, really empower the Landmarks Commission to stop interior alterations that do not affect, that, that are not interior landmarks, uh, that do not affect an exterior of the building. So, so it is under the landmark <clears throat> law, the commission's regulatory authority is extremely limited and the, the reconfiguration of interior spaces to, to, for, for in any configuration really is beyond the purview of the landmarks commission, except in those instances where it arguably affects the, an exterior architectural feature. So again, I think that's important to make clear. Okay, all right. Thank you. And uh, uh, Commissioner Shamir Barron, do you have a question for Mark or me or the staff? I okay, do. Let, do. Me, let me go. Why don't you go ahead and then we'll turn to the applicants. Uh, just in reference to, uh, to what was just said, are, are we sure, uh, what are our thoughts about whether or not a horse walk is interior or exterior? I, I am not convinced that it is an interior condition. Well, I will say that we have always acknowledged that these are significant features in both buildings in the historic district, as well as individual landmarks. And again, they are unique. We haven't had that many applications, um, but we have always acknowledged their significance in the his to the history of the buildings of this age and period and style. Exactly. So, so we have always regulated them very carefully and closely. Right, I'm asking something else. You mentioned the extent to which we uh, we oversee or can opine on interior conditions. And I'm just asking right. whether right. the horse walk is one. We would consider it an exterior feature, you know, that we would look, cause we're looking through, uh, it's, it's like looking through a gate or something past a, a side yard, if you will. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? So from, from in that perspective, yeah. we would consider it uh, within our regulatory purview. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to turn back to the applicant and ask if you'd like to respond to the comments we've heard. Yes, please, thank you, Chair Carroll. Um, many things. First off, um, I'd like to say that while this is a very nice federal house, I don't think it's any more intact or more special than other federal houses that the commission has designated as individual landmarks or as part of historic districts. Um, I think it more likely that it was an early designation because the owners of this house in 1966 were, um, were connected to New York City's preservation community, um, which was you know a small insular community where everyone knew each other. Um, 
Secondly, um, the designation report itself, which because it's from 1966 and, you know, uh, they were still, preservations were still learning their trade back then, let's just say. The designation report itself, the description of an, an analysis is two paragraphs that don't even mention the horse wall. Um, secondly, regarding uh, Community Board 2's uh, denial of the work at the rear, um, the, what they saw was a very different proposal than what we're showing you here today. Uh, when we presented this to the community board last March, uh, we were showing them a two-story rear addition with a very large modern glazed opening, modern, modern glazing uh, at the dormer. Um, we took those comments to heart and uh, spent many months coming up with al alternative designs that were we thought were in response to what the community board uh, voice concern about, and um, also coming up with all the necessary uh, structural drawings, monitoring plan, uh, supportive excavation drawings, um, means and methods plan for how to actually uh, orchestrate this work and the ex excavation so that it would be done safely to the body of the house and to its neighbors. Um, it's unfortunate, therefore, that the elected officials' testimony was referencing uh, the community board's uh, denial because really everything everything they said is is out of date. Um, secondly, we understand the concerns of some people in the in the community who saw the blast email from Village Preservation last Friday, uh, and uh, clicked on it to send LPC negative testimony. But there are two sides to every story. <clears throat> the truth of the matter is, with regard to the excavation, um, this is a scope of work that's been approved at hearing. And um, I think to some extent, when I worked at Landmarks a million years ago in the middle aughts, um, even at staff level, just to, to some degree, um, this type of excavation has been approved hundreds of times between the between the village, Upper West Side, Upper East Side, um, within the last 10 to 15 years. So uh, in addition to the examples I showed in the presentation um, of front houses that were connected to back houses by excavation under the lot, um, I want to Note, there's another example I can think of, which is uh, 24 East 10th Street, which is a project that I brought forward with Stephen Harris Architects, who you just saw in the previous application, uh, where the commission approved not only the construction of a new back house that was connected by a, an L to the main house, but that proposal also showed connecting the structures underground with an excavated cellar. Um, we are, of course, aware of the recent unfortunate circumstances at, um, at another house in the village involving excavation. Um, but I think it needs to be pointed out again, this type of work is much more common than people think. And the truth is the majority of the time, excavations and expansions underground are done safely and without incident. The catastrophes are the anomalies because LPC oversight works and DOB oversight works. The engineers on this team are the best in the business and the contractor and owner are eminently experienced in doing much more complicated projects than this. So I urge the commissioners to trust in the work of professionals. Um, let's see, I'd also like to note the previous item, 79 to, 7, uh, 79 to 81 Charles also showed substantial excavation and no one voiced concern about it. Um, uh, let's, see, um, let's see, oh, I also wanna note that um, this type of rear addition, a one story rear addition, is really modest compared to most of the additions on houses that the commission sees. And um, it's this type of addition has been approved many times on both individual landmarks and houses within historic districts. And uh, lastly, regarding the horse walk, um, again, there's no mention of the horse walk in the designation report. Um, and as we showed in the presentation, there are horse walks in the district that have been altered or removed since designation with LPC approval. and the permits for those projects didn't even call out the horse walk being existent um, and quite the opposite stated in their findings that no significant architectural fabric was removed by the work. So um, that begs the question, at what point does the horse walk become significant architectural fabric? This work will maintain the appearance of the horse walk from the street, just as those other approvals did because a, for a false door will, will remain. Um, that's it. Thank you very much, commissioners, for your consideration. Okay, thank you very much. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? All right, I don't see any questions, so I'm sending you all requests to unmute so that we can 
move to our discussion. All right, Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So move. Thank you. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So the hearing is closed. We've had a, a very a detailed presentation and we've heard very uh, detailed testimony on this, uh, the work at this individual landmark um, within this historic district. And so we will um, review this very carefully. We have changes to the rear facade of the main house, changes to the front facade of the back house, changes at the roof level, um, excavation and the um, reconfiguration of the interior and of including uh, incorporating the a horse walk into the interior space. So there's a, a number of aspects of this with respect to the um, excavation. I would just note that um, this building is uh, a good 35 years older than the previous application we saw. And we do uh, you know, note that our engineer uh, noted the age is a you know, an area of uh, that we should consider as uh, as we review this, um, given the potential for uh, pre-existing structural underlying conditions. So um, with that, I will uh, go ahead and we'll start the discussion. Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you like to start this one? Sure. But I think um, for this project, the fact that it's an individual landmark sets the bar much higher than other applications that we see where the building is obviously significant, but isn't part of a historic district. Um, this was an early designation. Um, I, you know, I think regardless of how it came to be designated, um, it's remained intact um, pretty much, it seems, for you know, well over 100 years in the front building seems to be largely intact from when it was built. Um, so I think that the, the horse walk is an integral part of the building and part of the character of the building and it needs to remain. Um, I think at the rear, I am concerned about excavating underneath the landmark itself. I think that that's extremely risky of a building this age and especially since it is hemmed in the way it is, is very difficult working conditions. Um, I think there may be more leeway in excavating the yard and the rear building. Um, and I think you could make a, uh, a passage between the two buildings that way without having to go underneath the landmark itself. I, mean, I think also the rear facade, I mean, the, the building is in totality a landmark. Um, so there's major alterations to the window fenestration patterns, I think is also takes the building out of character. Uh, I think the, keeping the, the odd anomalous window on the, on the second floor, the way it is, it shows the character of the original house and you know, aligning it and making it all symmetrical is a, a, you know, sort of a modern uh, concept. Um, and I think as well that the three, the pair of French doors um, really removes a lot of historic fabric and takes away that character. So I could see allowing for one you know, doorway out onto the terrace. And I think that, you, I think that, the, that the addition is probably okay, um, given that there is an areaway there now, um, it's sort of modest, um, it keeps the majority of the facade of the back of the house intact. Um, but I think the rest of the changes are, are not acceptable. Um, I think that the dormer is okay as well, because I think it's more sort of an additive thing rather than a reductive thing. Um, so I think I can, I can improve the, the dormer. Um, I feel the same way about the back building, uh, the changes there. I think that it, those, those three oversized French doors really changes the character of that back house. Um, I think a much more modest intervention is more appropriate. Um, I think I covered everything, but I'd really be curious to hear whatever other commissioners have to say. Okay, 
That's great. Thank you very much, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, well, I have a very, very substantial agreement with uh, uh, Anne's uh, comments that she just made. Um, the fact that this is an individual landmark does uh, bring it to a higher standard, but I also think that the this is very, very extensive um, excavation. And while we approve a lot of excavations, I can't remember one recently that's quite as much as this. And I think her point about the landmark being situated between the buildings and getting in there to do the work is a, a large concern. So I, I agree with her recommendation about um, not doing excavation under the landmark itself and perhaps under the uh, back building and the, uh, the uh, you know, whatever the uh, courtyard would be appropriate. I also agree that uh, horse walks are a really charming feature of, this, of these old buildings in the village. And in general, I think they should be preserved. And I don't really see a reason why in the uh, design this ha has to be eliminated as far as it not being mentioned in the early designation report. Uh, we all know that those early designation reports were very brief and often uh, contained very little about the uh, things that they were designated because that was just the practice at that time. And it doesn't mean that there was a lack of concern or interest in this particular feature. Um, so, and with regard to the fenestration changes, Normally we allow quite a bit of latitude on the back of buildings, but the fact this is an individual landmark, I think it does raise it to a higher standard as far as the changes that should be permitted. Uh, as far as the back building, um, the fenestration changes, yes, do change the character. Um, and the entire site, I guess, is part of the individual landmark. That's correct, That's right? Correct. So, yeah. so I would be, you know, I, I do think there's a need to permit some more light into the building, but I think it, it should be a restrained approach because of that, that particular aspect. I think that the dormer is fine, as, uh, as Anne reflected. I think that's, that's fine in this <clears throat> particular case. I think that actually works appropriately with, with the uh, landmark. Um, I, so I think those are uh, those are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. All right, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um, I don't have a lot to add. I am less concerned about the safety of the excavation as what it does to this site, this individual landmark site, and the relationship that is destroyed between the front building and the back building. Um, a, another thing that, that came to mind when, when I was a National Trust intern, I came to the city to study federal period buildings for um, the state actually to inform the Skirmahorn Row restoration for Jan Pokorny's office. And, and, this is one of the houses that I got into. And at that time, the roof framing was original. And so the addition of a dormer to this uh, roof, which is a irreversible, would also result in the destruction of a, an intact federal period framing system, which although it's on the interior is an, an integral part of this building. Um, so, Actually, there is absolutely nothing about this application um, that uh, I am in approval of. I, I vote to deny it. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Um, I, I think that uh, Anne and, and Diane um, uh, spoke very well um, uh, uh, about the, um, the conditions. And I think the, the, the fact that it is an individual landmark um, the tight constraint of the site and the risk involved. Um, I'm I'm in um, in agreement with their comments. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair Bland. Um, over the years, I think I've made it clear, maybe um, to everyone, of my I guess I'd call it an affection for <clears throat> federal 
houses. Um, they are ex pr precious, I think is the way I would call them precious because they're so few in our city, precious because they're so old. It's the oldest style of architecture that we exhibit in our city and precious in scale. And um, all of those aspects of federal houses um, make me think that maybe over the past um, many years that I've served on the commission, we've been a little too free sometimes with what we've allowed. At least this is my uh, reflection over a period of time now. Um, and therefore, particularly therefore, since this is an individual landmark, um, I am in agreement that much of what's being proposed here is not acceptable, not appropriate. Um, not sure I need to go through all of it. I guess the dormer on the back of the front house, I was thinking that maybe that would be acceptable, but I'm caught short a little bit with uh, Michael Devonshire's understanding of it and i think that gives me pause to wonder if that is appropriate although i get i understand we get caught in the in, in the interior versus the exterior aspect of that since it's an interior feature that would be demolished not an exterior one well I, uh, let me add to that yes, though we have please. on federal houses we have treated the pitched roof as a significant feature right, so not right. just the framing yeah. of the no, interior you're right. but you're the, right. the steeply pitched roof um we have allowed dormers particularly on non-visible portions of them on both individual landmarks and buildings in historic districts but we're very careful about how uh, and have been in the past very careful about how big the dormer is and how it, how much it changes the profile of that roof line right and also i think a shed dormer would be out of, out of historical context too so I'm not sure i can approve that i think the 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 the, the, the bottom of both of these buildings has taken a a, a kind of a trendy uh, feel and look that is inappropriate uh, to such an important landmark. Uh, the horse walk is, to, to my mind, completely critical and and integral to what this um, ensemble is all about. And to remove it and leave just a door reminding us of its once presence is wrong. Um, I'll also point out, not that it matters perhaps uh it would be awfully convenient to have such a thing to get back to the to the backyard uh but also to a whole back house not having to go through the front house to get through the back house in any event i, I don't know if i'm in the position of denying as a couple of commissioners have suggested but i'm certainly opposed to much of what's being um uh suggested here Okay, thank you very much. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, I think my fellow commissioners have been very, very, very eloquent. Um, and, and I'm in agreement with uh, pretty much everything. I'm just gonna mention a, a couple of things. Um, if there is a way even after hearing Michael speak, if there is a way to do a dormer that makes sense, uh, I think I could accept that. I am um, always very, uh, as part of the preservation, I'm always very sympathetic to the need to get light into a house. Um, for the inhabitants. And um, I think, and I think Anne may have um, alluded to this, I think there might be a way on the rear to do the windows so that they're very respectful, not only of the little quirkiness that, that currently exists, but of the style of a federal style townhouse so that um, even if it's not completely original, it, it works and the changes aren't um, out of whack. 
And, and I feel that way also about the back house as well, that, um, that it could happen there, not at the top, but not at the top floor, certainly, and uh, possibly not at the second level for the, for the front house rear, um, but certainly below that. Um, and the, it is, did I say the horse walk should be kept? It definitely yeah. should. And I completely agree about limiting um, within the house, the, uh, the front house, the excavation. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, uh, this is interesting for me because when I viewed this last night, I, I, I thought everything was okay. And then this morning I looked at it again and there was a picture of the courtyard and I realized that I was all wrong. You know, it's an individual landmark and that's special for me. I think when I go to this courtyard, I wanna see what it felt like a hundred years ago. So uh, I, I, uh, it's just very difficult for me to even come up with a way of the back, the back building to make it even work because that facade is so strange and different. And uh, I mean, if they put a pergola on the top, not a pergola, uh, a widow's walk or lantern on the top to bring light in, it might help. But I, I, I it, this is such a lovely thing. So I do think the, when I know it's a horse walk, must be kept. And the excavation, I think, we're at a point now that perhaps we can, you know, connecting the bottom makes sense. You know, they, they want to go from one side to the other. So I can, done professionally, it, it could work. But it, it, the dormer, oh, ah, it's painful. I, I don't know. It, uh, it's a landmark. It's something that when I go there, I feel a certain kind of atmosphere. So that's where I'm at. Commissioner Gustafson. Hmm. Well, being the uh, penultimate voice to speak um, on this one. Um, oh, not is, uh, quite, actually. <laughs> <laughs> How many are there after me? Adi. I said penultimate. Oh, yeah. right. OK. That's right. Um, I took uh, 23 notes on this. <laughs> and then I thought, you know, after listening to everybody, I thought, well, that's not really useful for me to repeat all of that. Um, I, I am in the, I, I, I do not hesitate to be in the Devonshire camp here. I would deny it. And for all the reasons that, um, that Michael stated. Okay. All right. Now, Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thanks. I, uh, so it is difficult to come after the, for this, to see this project on the same street as the previous and for us to have approved the previous one um, and others very much like it by that architect, uh, designed by that architect, and, and yet for us to be really struggling and in a, in a sense leaning towards the um, uh, potential non-approval of, of many of the things that are proposed here. And of course, and, and what separates the two conditions is this status of individual landmark, which of course is differentiated by just a stylistic moment, a little bit more age. Um, so there's something about it that's that's very tough. Um, but contextualist as I am, textualist as I am, um, if not, uh, I, I thought I would look at the um, at the uh, designation report. And it, there, there are three things that are actually very interesting that it's true. Uh, the report is much less elaborate than future reports would be, and it's um, you know only two paragraphs and has about it something that refers to its April 1966 construction. But it says three things that I find interesting. One, it describes does in fact describe a house with a peaked roof, delicate dormers, and so I think that the the the, the fact that those dormers are called. Um, and 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 identified as delicate, and the fact that they that there's reference to them says to me that they're 
that it is not appropriate to create another dormer and one that is clearly, in my mind, not delicate, but also would disturb the, as as Michael Devonshire was saying, the the structure that that supports <laughs> the kind of the dormers in any case, uh, even though on the other side. So that's one. Two, it notes after it says that with peaked roof, delicate dormers, it says and a high basement, which is interesting, because the basement that is that is high and annotated and, and noted in the report is in a sense being the proposal here is to eliminate it. Um, it because we are it's you know they are proposing to grow the ground the parlor floor and then to remove the basement floor and to create a new uh, the the excavated site. So I think that the fact that high basement is called and they are asking for its uh, a disappearance in whatever way I don't want to call it demolition but whatever we call it is is also inappropriate. Finally, um, while there is no direct reference to a horse walk, there's an interesting note at the very end of under findings and designations, which says that um, the uh, late federal brick house of excellent proportion and scale built of sound materials in the best tradition of craftsmanship that is, quote, evocative of the qualities of another century and of another way of life. And I, 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 maybe I'm a little bit of a, like, you know, into the kind of Talmudic readings, but actually that's a very interesting thing to say. And I think really does um, reference though, you know, and slightly tangentially, it references this, the kind of the, the historic meaning of this horse walk, which is very much part of this other way of life, one that is not, that, you know, we, we can't even um, reconstruct today. So I think that it's inappropriate to remove the horse walk as an interior exterior, but clearly significant historical feature. Okay, great, perfect. And thank you for actually referring to the designation report. I think that was a very helpful way to frame your comments and a nice way to sort of wrap up the general the essence of all of the comments that we've heard today. So we will not take an action today. Um, we have heard that uh, there's no support for exca excavation beneath the main house, but that the ex excavation um, could be considered if it were scaled back and uh, limited to the back and the yard. Um, that the horse, I think everybody has uh, agreed that the horse walk is a significant feature and should remain. And I think we've heard some comments that um, some fenestration uh, changes could be appropriate, but that they need to restudy the uh, dormer and the, the scale and position and detailing of the dormer and fenestration on both the rear facade of the house as well as the front facade of the back house. So we'll take no action um, and we'll uh, ask uh, the applicants to think about our comments and um, we'll welcome them back if they have a revised proposal and when they're ready to come back. All right. Thank you. For, we'll, thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Right. Um, I think we are very behind schedule, but why don't we try to do one more item today uh, before lunch and that will... Um, you know, hopefully we can, that will get us out of this general uh, neighborhood. It'll get us into Chelsea and then we can start after lunch on the Upper East and Upper West Sides. Okay, so Corey, we'll do one more. Okay, um, and, and I'll just also note that I, as stated earlier, we will do that one public meeting item uh, first after lunch and then yes. return to public hearing items. Okay, so now we'll do public hearing item number four. LPC 23-04117, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 717, lot 73, 458 West 20th Street in the Chelsea Historic District. This is a Greek Revival style row house built in 1845. The application is to relocate through wall louvers and legalize facade work without LPC permits. Okay, commissioners, the applicants are just joining the um hearing. Uh, and you now have control of the screen. Just click on the presentation to start and state your name for the record and you may begin. Hi, good afternoon. This is Courtney Wollaston, the architect for 458 West 20th Street. 
And hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Taylor with Higgins Quays Barth and Partners, preservation consultant. Um, I'm joined by architect Courtney Wollaston, who just spoke, uh, Matthew Muller, who represents the ownership of the 458 West 20th Street Co-op, and my colleague, Ward Dennis. Um, Courtney, if you could just go to the um, second, well, first, the first slide uh, showing the building in the Chelsea Historic District, 458 West 20th. Um, and if you can move to the next slide. Um, uh, this project began with the proposal to relocate a haphazard array of antiquated through wall louvers at the front facade of this co-op building, originally a row house, as part of a needed upgrade of the building's mechanical systems and to significantly improve the appearance of this altered facade. It emerged during review with LPC staff that the existing condition includes other work carried out without a permit decades ago by previous ownership. So the scope before you includes legalization of certain features along with the current owner's plan to improve the existing condition of the building. So I'd like to briefly outline the history of the building and its current appearance uh, before Courtney presents the proposed work. Uh, Courtney, if you can advance. Um, the 1940 tax photo at the left shows what was built as a Greek revival townhouse <clears throat> in 1845 and significantly altered over its life, including the addition of the top floor, removal of a stoop and creation of the basement level entrance. Before designation in 1970, the building had already been internally reconfigured as a multifamily building. The center line of windows where partitions had been introduced behind them were already infilled with recessed brick masonry as seen in the designation era photo at the right. Uh, and the former uh, parlor level windows were also shortened. And next slide. Um, while they were not present at the time that designation photograph was taken, LPC has determined that the louver penetrations were DOB permitted prior to designation and are legal, as is the painted facade. And the photo it left um, shows those louvers in place in 1985. However, LPC staff determined that the existing condition includes other work carried out without a permit by previous ownership many years ago. This includes um, at the former center window openings, removal of the remnant lintels and sills and installation of flush brick. So you can see that in the current photo at right. Um, the recreation of profile lintels in the um, flanking uh, bays of windows uh, in cast stone matching brownstone with profiles that are consistent with similar buildings in the district. Um, and the rustication detailing at the brownstone stucco base, which is also consistent with the basement levels of brick row houses in the district. So these conditions are presented for legalization alongside the proposal to relocate the louvers so as to significantly reduce their impact and produce, improve the appearance of the facade. Um, so Courtney, you wanna take it over from there with the next slide. Great, thanks so much. So uh, thanks for meeting today. I'll walk you briefly through our presentation here. So as Jonathan described, the scope of work is to reorganize the HVAC louvers on, underneath the windows centered. Our goal is to clean up the facade and make it more orderly and organized. The louvers are gonna be painted to match the existing facade color. Um, the historic photos indicate, as Jonathan mentioned, the removal of these recessed brick bay of windows and the lintels that were, the lintels and sills that were organized here. <clears throat> so part of our work here is legalization of the lintels and rusticated base. Um, we have to look at the different facade conditions in the district and it identified a number of buildings with similar details. Let's see. So here you can see some examples of the windows with the louvers organized underneath them, and also the rustication of our facade as it is now. Um, more streetscape seen here with different rustica rustication of the masonry at the base level. Um, some details of our louvers that we're putting in and the, the louvers are three foot wide by one foot high. Um, just some floor plans to see the organization of the rooms here with the walls that are um, centered on the window where the windows used to be. 
prior to designation. And just a quick rendering of what the organization will look like with the louvers underneath the windows and the current condition of the existing louvers. The, that sums up our presentation here with the relocation of a big improvement of organization on the facade. Okay, thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions, so let's move to public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Cor uh, Gregory Kala to take us through the testimony. Okay, thank you so much, Chair Carroll. We received a few signups in advance, so we'll be going through those first. The first of which is Kerry Keenan. So Carrie, I will be promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please state your name for the record and unmute your line, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hi there, thank you. Sorry for the mask. Um, thank you, Chair Carroll and commissioners. I'm Carrie Keenan, co-chair of Community Board 4's Chelsea Land Use Committee. Um, at our full board meeting on January 4th, 2023, Manhattan Community Board 4 voted unanimously to recommend denial of the application for a proposed renovation and legalization of numerous previous LPC violations of 458 West 20th Street. The board particularly objects to, first, the proposed further removal of historic uh, facade brick for incongruous well through air conditioning units. The board suggested other options for air conditioning, such as the use of ductless mini split air conditioners, which are affordable, and would not require facade penetrations or disruptive interior ductwork. Second, the proposed addition of a further coat of moisture trapping and potentially damaging paint to the brick facade. The current painting of the building may in itself be a further existing violation, although I just did hear that it isn't, but that's something we'd ask for LPC to investigate in our letter. And finally, the proposed legalization of existing violations that detract from the building's character defining row house form. These include center window brick infill made flush to the, to the remaining facade, center window lintels and sill removal, top story window lintels protruding in a different configuration from the designation date photo, window sills painted, rustic, rustication lines added to brownstone material at the base of the basement facade. Um, instead of correcting these violations, the applicant seeks to have them approved after the fact. The recessed infill of the center windows at the time of designation at least express the iconic three window wide form of a Greek revival row house and should be restored. At best, we would like to see the reinstatement of actual windows at the infill locations, given the extraordinary protective view they would provide across the general theological seminaries grounds to some of its picturesque architect. This building has suffered from years of unchecked violations, as we can see from literal before and after photos, and the after photos should serve as a warning as to what happens when LPC rules are ignored. To approve these violations now would absolve those who carried them out and only encourage others to alter designated, designated buildings without LPC approval. One quick note that one of the applicants mentioned during the presentation just now, was that this is a needed upgrade to mechanical systems. This was not presented to us as necessary, nor do we think it is. And we suggested other ways to accommodate the air conditioners. We ask you to please consider our recommendations and thank you very much for hearing our testimony. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, next up, we will be hearing from Lucy Levine from the Historic Districts Council. So Lucy, I'm promoting you to panelists now. And if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, commissioners. My name is Lucy Levy, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Historic Districts Council. HGC finds nothing appropriate about this solution. Instead of centering through wall louvers underneath windows on the primary facade, the applicant should restore the building's original window configuration back to three windows per floor and utilize the air shaft as a more appropriate location for running condensate lines to the roof. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. And next up, we'll be hearing from Christina Conroy from VSNY. And Christina, I'm promoting you to panelist right now. So if you could please unmute your line and state your name for the record, you'll have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello. 
<clears throat> okay, uh, good um, afternoon, commissioners. I'm Christina Conroy for the Victorian Society. Now, the Victorian Society supports the removal of the existing through the wall HVAC sleeves and louvers, removal of these units scattered randomly across the upper floors prior to designation will not eliminate any historic material. Cutting eight new openings centered under the existing windows won't destroy a significant amount of historic masonry and the balanced symmetrical patterns of these openings will help to unify the facade. We also support the legalization of cementious brownstone material added to the archway facade and lintels. Although the 1940 tax photo doesn't show rusticated brownstone cladding in the area way or any lintel details, the photographs the applicant has provided show that both are typically found at row houses of this age and type in this and other historic districts. There's also ample evidence of area way facades being reclad when the stoops were removed and the lintels are simply detailed and do not recall and do attention to themselves. However, we suggest the addition of a string course at the top of the airway cladding. Uh, this would help balance the relationship between the modified base and the more elaborately detailed historic cornice. Now that ends the list of changes we support. Now we are appalled by the illegal infill which has obliterated the historic blind window openings and destroyed the domestic character of this building. The work has eliminated extremely significant facade material. It's altered the entire character of the building, which now appears to be a strange hybrid combination of warehouse and tenement, and it's diminished the unity of the block. We recommend denial of this work in the strongest possible way and that the applicant be required to restore the blind windows. Finally, we urge the commission to reach out to the DOB to determine if all the interior work shown on the floor plans was legally filed with that agency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. I do not see any further hands raised, so I will bring it back to you, Chair Carroll. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I would um, like to turn to the applicants and ask if you'd like to respond to the testimony. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, I'll just br briefly restate um, uh, that, you know, the the lintels and sill, the lintels and um, uh, rustication details that were added to the building, I think, as HGC also uh, pointed out, are uh, appropriate to the district. Um, with regard to comments about, you know, the center windows, um, you know, it's, I just want to reiterate, it's not an option to recreate window openings at these locations and this, which was where we, where the interior was reconfigured already prior to designation. And there's, um, these are, uh, you know, occupied multifamily apartments uh, behind those, uh, locations. Um, and, you know, to, to restore, uh, to, with bl with blind openings would be only to to be able to restore to a to itself a very uh, compromised condition um and i think that's those are the main points okay all right thank you commissioners do we have any other questions for the applicant okay and I, sorry if i can yes just, oh, i also just want to say once again you know that you know for what it's worth that these those changes were carried out um I think believe in the 1980s by you know quite a long time ago by at least one owner back so sorry okay all right and and i do want to just note that the um the the removal of the windows in the center of the building happened prior to designation um with an apartment wall installed directly behind where they would have existed and they were filled in um with a recess and mm -hmm with sills and lintels and new brick was installed flush with the sills and lintels above that, um, which uh, was removed without permits after designation. So the, um, the, the brick that was installed without permits has been removed. The, as we all know, the commission cannot compel restoration of missing features if it's not part of the work that's being proposed. And so, um, we would not be able to compel them to restore those window openings, even as blind openings. Um, but the proposal is to legalize, and the proposal before us is to legalize the lintels and sills, the relocation of the louvers to beneath windows, and 
um, the rusticated base. And we do have some a few more questions. So yeah, I, I just want to clarify the, the yeah. one thing. It, it is the additional brick blind opening. Oh, sorry, I, I misread that. Okay, great, thank you. All right, um, Commissioner Demeter, did you not have a question anymore? Was it, did that answer your question? I I did, but uh, I'm, I guess I'm a little confused. So okay. the addition of the brick to the blind openings is what the violation was about, correct? It is for, it is for that and the removal of the sills and lintels, which were still in place even after they had done the recessed infill prior to designation. But, but we cannot compel them to so I, so restore I, those blind so openings? We can restore the blind openings to the way it was at the time of designation. Okay. And the, the applicant said that would that would create a compromised condition. What would that compromised condition be? So as you'll see in the floor plans, um, the, the rooms in the apartments have been split up. So there's now a wall in the location that splits different privately owned apartments. Right, but that doesn't preclude blind windows. Right. That's correct. So, so what would the compromise condition be if, you, if you're reinserting the blind openings? I simply meant I'm not talking the, about I'm not talking about punched openings for windows. I'm talking about blind the blind openings which have masonry in. I was simply clarifying in response to some uh, testimony about reestablishing windows that you know there, there was not an opportunity to restore to the historic condition of window openings here, but only to an existing uh, altered condition, um, which was present at the time of designation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lutfi. Um, Michael, thank you for asking that question. It is, it is true just from a window standpoint that, um, the, you know, the windows can't go back. These are now, this is a co-op building. I just looked at all the floor plans again. And, you know, there were walls in place where the windows were. So, um, but thank you for the clarification about uh, the recessed windows. Now, I just, I have a date question, date questions. The first is what was the year of designation and what was the year that the building was co opted um, designation was in 1970, I believe, of this district. Um, and Courtney or Matt, if you're on, do you have the? I it, I think the co-op was formed in 2019. 2019. So so does that mean that? So I'm sorry, the windows came out when? Sometime in the 80s. No, Sorry. the windows came out prior to designation. So we have the designation photo. So they yes, came out. They came out. That right. means they came out in the sixties, and at that and at that moment, I just want to clarify this. And at that moment, the building, I guess, was a rental building, and the co-oping didn't happen until much later. Can someone? Sorry, the co-op was created in the eighties, nineteen eighty. Okay. 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 Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, the applicant uh, did not respond to one of the uh, testimony uh, aspects that I think would be useful, uh, which is just to explain why this is the appropriate solution to the air conditioning as opposed to some other things suggested by various uh, testimony. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Our client took a look at like they said, like uh, someone commented that we would um, run condensate lines through the shaft way. And it is a feasibility, but it would have to run through the sea line apartment, which is privately owned um, on multiple floors. So it would not be feasible for all locations. So um, this they wanna keep the existing system as it is now. And the apartments in the back also had the same system. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay. 
All right, so let's uh, let's move to close the hearing and start our discussion. All right, Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All you opposed? Yeah, okay. You. All right. So um, the proposal before us, the aspects that we are looking at is the legalization of the uh, browns, the cementitious material to create a rusticated base, the new window lentils and sills, and the brick infill within the formerly blind openings that were uh, created at the time prior to the time of designation. And then to modify the mechanical systems to move the uh, louvers out of the center of the building and to place them uh, centered beneath the window openings. And uh, we have the existing condition on the left and the proposed condition on the right. And we'll begin our discussion. Commissioner Lutfi, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um... I mean, I, okay, uh, it's always unfortunate when work happens without our approval. Um, and I, I just don't understand why, especially since this is a co-op and they should know better. Um, and also because it is a historic district. So I, I certainly think it would improve the, the, the uh, would, it's, it would be a huge improvement. And we do approve louvers under, under windows quite regularly. And it makes sense to, for them to be in that place so that there is some uniformity here in terms of uh, where, you know, where they are and, and they might not, and they'll be a little less visible. I happen to think the facade looks, it's very unfortunate that the windows were taken out to uh, make this uh, a very efficiently laid out multi-unit uh, building, but they did come out. And um, that said, I actually think it looked much better with the, the uh, recessed blank, you know, bricked windows with lentils. And um, I would recommend putting that back and uh, with lentils again, that uh, meet our staff's approval. Um, and I, th I think that's it. Okay, and the design of the uh, lintels and sills as they've presented is, um, do you find that those are consistent with the variety of details that we find in the district? I, I think that they need to, uh, they, they seem to be, but they need to work with staff to make okay. sure that they, can, that they are. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Jefferson? Um. Yes, um, <clears throat> uh, the relocated wall louvers, uh, I agree, makes the facade look much better. Absolutely. Uh, I think the, the lintels um, replacement is, works well, the brown color. I do think that we should, they should, in the blind, the blind windows in. Because right now, this looks almost like a surreal, Italian perspective, you know, and putting that in would, would make it much better. Okay, great. Thanks. Commissioner Gustafson. Well, these situations are standard um, is um, generally speaking, whether we would have approved um, the illegal work if it had come to us at, in the first instance, sometimes that works in the applicant's favor. Um, Proving things that um, uh, they didn't come to us with, um, and sometimes um, it works against them. Um, I agree with uh, Commissioner uh, Jefferson that, uh, in, I think, in every respect, the louvers, moving the louvers is fine, uh, but um, the rest restoration of the blind windows is essential. And um, and although 
I might have been a little more severe on the lintels and all of that. I uh, agree that we should rely on our staff's expertise there to, uh, to to bring those to whatever condition they feel is appropriate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Holford smith I think me. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Shamir Barron. I okay, me. thank you. Um, <laughs> I agree with everything that's been said. Uh, I do think that they should um, be required to remedy the violation, which in this case would mean um, re recreating these blind windows, which may, you all tell me, will probably be the first. I, I can't imagine there has been any other example of the re recreation of a blind window as a, a, the blind window as the historic feature. <laughs> it's incredible. One. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree. Um, the blind windows need to be be restored. Um, I think the brownstone at the base is fine, and I think moving the louvers under the windows is a vast improvement. Okay, thanks. And Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, I agree with Commissioner Holford Smith. Um, we do sometimes approve evolution, but. Uh, in this case, it has created an odd looking facade with the no historical reference, um, which doesn't speak uh, to the district at all. And uh, my understanding from the uh, discussion is this took place well before the current owners and the co-op, but nonetheless, I think they, we should be requiring them to uh, re replace the blind openings and the rusticated base uh, is fine. Okay, and the louvers, the louvers are also fine. Great. Commissioner Devonshire? I agree with my colleagues. Okay. And Commissioner Chen? Yeah, so not to be blindsided, uh, I'm in total agreement with the colleagues. Okay, thanks. And Commissioner Bland? Um, I'll uh, be a minority of one and say I'm not really insisting that they uh, recreate those blind windows. Otherwise, everything else is okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think um, we do have a majority here though who do uh, would recommend that the blind windows be restored to the condition they were at the time of designation with the recessed brick and lintels and sills. I think the lintels can sills can match the lintels and sills that we approve on the other windows. Um, which is a, a slightly different detail than was allowed uh, uh, existing at designation, but uh, will work, you know, and rely on the staff's expertise to uh, ensure that those are consistent with the district. So, um, Commissioner Lutfi, would you be comfortable making the motion? You just have to tweak it a little bit at the end of the first page. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I was talking and nothing was coming out. <laughs> um, so yes, I can do that. No problem. Um, I think in the in the matter of DACA twenty three dash zero four one one seven four fifty eight West Twentieth Street, Chelsea Historic District, a Greek revival style, revival style row house built in 1845. The application is to relocate through wall louvers and legalize facade work performed without landmark preservation commission permits. I know that the building style scale materials and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Chelsea Historic District. I recommend approval with some modifications, finding that the relocation of louvers are in keeping with uh, the gradual modifications to the front facade and associated conversion of the building into a multiple dwelling, which have occurred since the early 20th century and possibly earlier, that the house is near the end of the block between a modern apartment building and a shorter row of houses. Therefore, the work will not detract from a unity of a row or the streetscape that the reorganization of the louvers below window openings will eliminate the existing regular pattern in the middle of the facade, which detracts from the historic character of the building and the streetscape, that the replacement louvers will be uniform in placement and size, simply designed, flush mounted and painted to blend with the masonry and therefore 
they will have a more neutral secondary uh, presence uh, that the replacement lintels uh, replicate the historic lintels in terms of placement, size, texture, and finish with only minor variations in terms of profiles and details that the replacement lintels and the rustication of the building base are consistent with the Greek revival style of the house uh, in terms of their pattern profiles and details, thereby helping to return the house closer to its original character. Um, However, um, I recommend that the applicant uh, uh, recreate uh, the blind uh, windows that had uh, originally uh, been created uh, so that they blend uh, with uh, the windows that are there and, and blend with the brickwork and that they work with staff closely on this uh, to match uh, also the windows uh, sills uh, with the building's other details. Great, thank you. All right, and uh, Commissioner uh, Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Sorry, Mark, we didn't hear you. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford. Aye. With 10 in favor and opposed, the motion passes. Okay, so um, it is 1.10. This is going to conclude our morning session. We will break for lunch and come back at 1.40. We will start with the public meeting item uh, for Middle Collegiate Church, and then we will go back to our, uh, finish up the public hearing items and the public meeting items. So uh, we'll ask all members of the public to voluntarily exit the meeting at this time so that if you wish to return, you don't have any technical difficulties as we will be closing the meeting for this half hour. Uh, commissioners, I'll see you all at 1.40. Thank you.